Rise and shine, dear viewer. Rise and shine. Not that I wish to imply you have been sleeping on the job. No one is more deserving of a rest. But our efforts to tell about the Half-Life universe would have gone to waste until... Well, let's just say your hour has come again. The right viewer in the right place can make all the difference on YouTube. So wake up, dear viewer. Wake up, and legendary videos are waiting for you again. How many wonderful games has Valve given us? No, 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 Artifact, don't get into the frame. Everyone has already forgotten about you. Uh, in fact, there are quite a lot. Two parts of Half-Life, two episodes of Half-Life, two portals, two Left 4 Deads, two Team Fortress, and some other games with the number two. Didn't Valve even count to three? Sorry. But all this would not have happened if it weren't for it, the success of Valve's first game, the legendary Half-Life. And today, we will begin to dive into a fascinating story about the Valve Company formation, the birth of the first Half-Life, which has grown into a whole series, and we will look at all the Easter eggs and plunge into the minds of the geniuses behind it. This video is not just a story about the game's creation. This is a story of courage, tenacity, and passion that led to the creation of a masterpiece that has the ability to fascinate and inspire players around the world. Ready to find out how Valve revolutionized the gaming industry and why Half-Life is considered one of the greatest masterpieces in gaming history? You're watching Press X. Sit back and welcome to a world where number three does not exist. Good morning and welcome to the Black Mesa Transit System. Behind all brilliant ideas, there are equally brilliant people. You've probably heard that Valve often hires young game designers, creators of successful mods and games, thereby helping these young talent develop. You're definitely familiar with the name Gabe Newell. However, few people know where the path of this now legendary developer and the Valve company began. Since the company's formation, Valve has been attracting interesting ideas from enthusiasts to its team to make games with them. Thus, Team Fortress, Counter-Strike, and Dota 2 were born from mods for games and became independent products. But Gabe was not one of the developers invited to work. He created the company. Long before Valve was founded back in the early 1980s, Gabe Newell entered Harvard University. He was interested in programming since childhood and dreamed of gaining unique knowledge in writing code at Harvard. However, according to him, he was frankly bored at the university and did not gain any specific knowledge. Expectations were not met. So in 1983, at the insistence of the head of the Microsoft sales department, Gabe dropped out of school. Yes, he was invited to work for Bill Gates in a then little known company developing computer software and other products. Today, you would say, wow, but back then there was nothing remarkable about it. Gabe was a diligent worker and did not even notice how 13 years flew by. Newell spoke more positively about his experience at Microsoft because in just three months at the company, he gained more knowledge than the entire time he spent at Harvard. Now he had that coveted experience of working, coding, and creating products. Over the course of 13 years, Gabe became a self-proclaimed producer of the first three versions of Windows, and along with it became a Microsoft millionaire. Essentially, a term used to describe a person who has earned over $1 million while working for Microsoft. So he didn't make money himself, but collectively with the rest of the employees. But a million is still a million. While Newell was at Microsoft, he led program management for the Windows operating system, including holding several positions in the systems, applications, and advanced technology divisions that worked on the release of Windows 1, Windows 2.0, and Windows 2.1, and were the driving force behind the introduction of Windows NT. It is not known whether Gabe had a hand in Windows 3, but it seems he was already afraid of this number. Interestingly, while working on Windows 1 back in the 80s, one of the developers created an Easter egg which was first discovered only 36 years later. In the original versions of Windows 1.0, there was a short list of the members of the Windows development team encrypted into a bitmap file. It was planned that when the system was updated, the title, Congrats, the Windows team, with the names of the developers appeared. But due to some bug, this feature never worked. So, in the found list of 36 employees, is it a coincidence? One of the most famous names today is Gabe Newell. 
Over 13 years at Microsoft, the guy's enthusiasm gradually evaporated because the innovations that inspired Gabe so much rarely occurred at Microsoft. There was nothing interesting for him in creating another operating system. Working at Microsoft has become a chore. Gabe wanted growth and development. He wanted to feel inspired again and create something interesting. And then in 1993, something interesting began to happen around the developer. Doom, a first-person shooter game developed by id Software, appeared on computer screens. The game revolved around a space marine, eventually unofficially named Doom Guy, fighting hordes of the undead and demons invading from space from the moons of Mars to hell. Doom became a real breakthrough in the world of video games and found worldwide success. It will set the vector of development for the entire shooter genre for many years to come. However, we also have Gabe Newell to thank for this. The fact is that in 1993, Gabe was quite addicted to the game and spent more than one evening playing through it, and then he thought, why not make a port of Doom for Windows? Yes, the game was originally released under MS-DOS, but Newell didn't like it because most computers were already coming out with newer operating systems. Id Software didn't even distribute through retail. It distributed through bulletin boards and other pre-internet mechanisms. To me, that was a lightning bolt. Microsoft was hiring 500 people sales team and this entire company was 12 people. Yet, it had created the most widely distributed software in the world. There was a sea of change coming. Bill Gates agreed with the idea of releasing Doom on Windows and Gabe Newell assigned several of his wards to write a port of the game. Microsoft even wanted to hire id Software to port Dooms to Windows in 1995 to promote Windows as a gaming platform. When id Software refused, Gabe Newell prepared a free licensed port of Doom 95 for them, and Microsoft received the desired PR for the operating system as being favorable to games. This will affect the Windows system in the future, but that's not what our story is about. More about that another time. Soon after the successful game porting, Microsoft and Gabe Newell will go their separate ways. Also in 1995, developer Michael Abrish, who worked at the company on graphics and assembly code, processor commands in human-readable form, left Microsoft. Abrish was originally a video game programmer in the early days of the IBM PC and color graphics, but during his time at Microsoft, like Gabe, he became bored. Therefore, Michael Abrish decided to return to what he liked and was hired by id Software to work on their new game, Quake. In general, a funny thing happened. Id Software not only refused to become part of Microsoft, they, one might say, lured away its employee. And with the Quake release in 1996, this small game studio made another breakthrough. Gabe had seen enough of other people's successes and decided it was time to change something. And when his colleague Mike Harrington asked him to leave Microsoft, they quit together to create something of their own. Inspired by id Software and Quake, they decided to start making video games. And already on August 24th, 1996, Gabe Newell and Mike Harrington created their own company called Valve. Interestingly, it was the day Gabe married Lisa Minet Newell. We signed the LLC agreement the same day uh, that I got married. Uh, I was standing there all dressed up to go off and do my wedding vows, and Mike is frantically shoving papers under my pen so that we can get that taken care of. It certainly makes it easier to remember the company's anniversary and, and my wedding anniversary since they're on the same. The new company's office was located in Kirkland, Washington, about five miles from the Microsoft campus in Redmond. The name of the company, remembered by many for its iconic screensaver. was the first thing the fellow founders thought about, and it might have been different initially. They didn't want the title to simply imply testosterone-gorged muscles in the extreme of anything. Instead, they considered Newell and Harrington, hollow box or rhino scar, for which Gabe drew a vague cartoon outline of a man with a round hole in the middle of his torso, as he recalled in an old interview. We had other names for Valve. One was Fruit Fly Ensemble, speaking of terrible names. Another was Rhino Scar, which was fun because of the visual. We'd have had this guy running around. But no, it was Valve. Actually, the cartoon outline of a man with a hole turned into a non-cartoon logo of a man with a valve on his head. And then the work moved at a completely different pace. The developers chose a shooter as their first project, and they wanted to release it as soon as possible. Their second step was to purchase the source code for the Quake engine, which Newell and Harrington modified, and based on it, they made the gold source engine. 
the forefather of everyone's favorite Source engine. But more on that later. Well, the third step was the start of the game development. The game named Quiver. What, haven't heard of it? Yeah, this is the working title of the game, which was shown at E3 in 1997, where it caused a real sensation. What game is this? We think everyone has already figured it out. Making the perfect first-person shooter from absolute scratch seemed impossible. The same Michael Abrish helped Newell and Harrington inviting the developers to license the Quake engine, and they agreed. Though id Software was not particularly happy that some little-known company wanted to use their engine for some of its projects. They expected it to be another soulless clone of Doom, which became very popular after its release. However, Michael Abrish convinced id Software management to trust the guys and allow them to license the engine. And in addition to this, Newell and Harrington received a lot of useful advice for the future. Starting with recommendations for working with the engine and up to hiring employees for the company. Id Software recommended that Gabe look for Quake fans to join his development team, since there should be people among them with experience working with the Quake engine and with the talent for game design. They even shared with Gabe a list of the best Quake modders they knew. That's how Valve adopted its favorite method of recruiting as a basis, hiring young developers from modders. It's worth saying that Valve also repeatedly tried to lure Abrish to their side. Well, over time they succeeded, but more on that later. As a result, by combining the Quake engine with its code, Valve, according to Gabe Newell, created about 75% of the final engine code. Skeletal animation has been added, allowing them to animate 3D models, as well as Direct 3D, which is part of DirectX, to render 3D graphics without losing performance. At the same time, Valve was looking for a publisher for its future project, but many companies considered it too ambitious for a small, newly created studio. In the end, they managed to find a publisher. It was Sierra Online. So you understand, up to this point, Sierra had released such high-profile games as point-and-click adventure game Space Quest VI, Roger Wilco and the Spinal Frontier, interactive movie point-and-click adventure game The Beast Within, a Gabriel Knight mystery, horror-themed point-and-click PC adventure game Shivers 2, as well as Hoyle Poker, Power Chess 98, Front Page Sports Golf, and other sports games. Well... Okay, jokes aside, there were a lot of games, but there were almost no popular ones, except perhaps the expansion to Diablo Hellfire and the city-building game Caesar 3. However, after the release of Half-Life and its expansions, the company began to release larger games based on films and poker. Sierra was interested in making a 3D action game, especially using the Quake engine, and signed a short-term contract to produce one game. Thus, Valve began developing the game, tentatively titled Quiver. As the project expanded, Valve canceled development of another of its ideas, the fantasy role-playing game Prospero, and the Prospero team joined work on Quiver, the future Half-Life. Half-Life development was heavily influenced by id Software's first-person shooters, Doom and Quake, because in fact, the Valve project was inspired by them. In a later interview, Gabe Newell said, Half-Life, in many ways, was a reactionary response to the trivialization of the experience of the first-person genre. Many of us had fallen in love with video games because of the phenomenological possibilities of the field and felt like the industry was reducing the experiences to least common denominators rather than exploring those possibilities. Our hope was that building worlds and characters would be more compelling than building shooting galleries. According to Half-Life designer Harry Teasley, Doom was a major source of inspiration because it was great at scaring the player. Valve wanted their future game to scare you like Doom did. The developers looked closely at the horror genre. They also took inspiration from Stephen King's 1980 novella The Mist, the X-Files series, and a 1963 episode of the classic science fiction horror anthology show The Outer Limits, titled The Borderland, or rather, the entire series, but the team remembered this episode the most. Actually, thanks to Stephen King's story, the project received the working title quiver in honor of the Arrowhead military base in the mist. And they changed the name to Half-Life, the one that is familiar all over the world today, because it was easy to associate with what was happening in the game. And besides, it was fresh. The Greek letter lambda, which in nuclear physics represents the decay constant and the Half-Life equation, was used as a memorable visual symbol. This is how the iconic name Half-Life appeared, and lambda became the game's logo. Visually, according to game designer Brett Johnson, Half-Life's level design was inspired by the post-apocalyptic cyberpunk setting of the Akira manga. The most interesting thing is the company's approach to development. 
The fact is that Valve first prepares various unrelated developments, and then based on these developments, they assemble the game itself. This is how they created Half-Life, and this is how they will do it after it. And at the E3 presentation in 1997, the company's first project arrived in exactly that disassembled form. There was no trace of the game itself yet. There were only some developments in levels, characters, animations, and artificial intelligence. But all this has already impressed critics and increased the degree of anticipation for the game. What was innovative about Valve's artificial intelligence was the introduction of fear and pack behavior among the characters. Opponents could retreat, hide from character attacks behind cover, use alternative weapons, and attack the player in groups. They wanted to finish the game by November 1997 to try to compete with Quake 2, but id Software again burst into this story like Deus Ex Machina. There, Quake 2 made a new breakthrough and ruined Valve's plans. Half-Life's publisher insisted on working longer in the game to make it better than Quake 2. Additionally, by September of that year, the team found that despite some of the innovative aspects in weapons, enemies, and level design, the game was not fun, and there was little cohesion in the design. As a result, the release date was postponed indefinitely. Gabe Newell decided to rework every level and element of the game. The opportunity to strengthen the team was given to writer and screenwriter Mark Laidlaw, who joined Valve just after the success at E3. Half-Life fans simply must know this man, because he will become the screenwriter of the entire game series, and it is he who should be thanked for how the entire Half-Life series turned out. As an undergraduate, Laidlaw attended the University of Oregon, where he tried punch card programming, but was disappointed. Perhaps today, no one will remember these pieces of cardboard on which digital data was recorded using perforated holes. Not surprisingly, Mark was disappointed by this activity. Instead, he found a creative streak and began writing short stories, and his first published novel was the sci-fi black comedy Dad's Nuke. In the 90s, Mark Laidlaw became interested in arcade and computer games, but had no particular desire to associate himself with this field until he played the adventure game Myst, which literally captured his consciousness. He was obsessed with Myst and even bought a new computer to play games on it. Not just this one, but others as well. Actually, after this, his desire to write novels became closely connected with games, so in 1996 he wrote the novel The Third Force, based on the world of the game Gadget, Invention, Travel, and Adventure. A year later, he joined the Valve Company. The screenwriter planned to work on the fantasy game Prospero until it was cancelled. Then he became part of the team working on Half-Life, and a heavy burden fell on his shoulders, adding old storytelling techniques to the company's ambitious project. As Mark later admitted, rather than dictating narrative elements from some kind of ivory tower of authorial inspiration, he worked with the team to improvise ideas and was inspired by their experiments. Mark contributed to the visual foundations of level design and, in his words, focused on, quote, doing storytelling with the architecture. The narrative had to be baked into the corridors. It's about to go critical. What the hell is going on with our equipment? For example, when at the beginning of the game the player approaches the characters to talk, they all refuse him with the words, Not now, Gordon. Or here's the moment where the scientist behind the glass was talking to the G-Man. If the player followed them for a long time, the scientist would approach the glass and close the blinds. It was this approach that led to Half-Life's trademark perfect pacing, as well as plenty of dark comedy in which scientists were sucked into vents and then ejected piece by piece. To rework the game, Valve took a new approach. A small team of developers was tasked with building a prototype level containing every element in the game, and then iterating on it over the course of a month. Obviously, to somehow diversify and get the right version. When the rest of the development team saw the level, which they called Die Hard Meets Evil Dead, they decided to use it as a basis. It was good for three reasons. Firstly, there were several interesting things happening in it, like G-Man's first appearance, the player meeting Dr. Kleiner, the player putting on a suit, and all of them were triggered by the player himself, and, and not a timer, allowing the player to set the pace of the passage. Secondly, the level responded to any player action, even the simplest one, like adding graphic decals to the wall textures to show a bullet hit. And thirdly, and most importantly, the level warned the player of imminent danger, allowing him to prepare a little, instead of attacking the player without warning. Before Mark Laidlaw joined the company, a team of six people from all departments at Valve, called Cabal, worked on the narrative design. 
So as we design the games here at Valve, a lot of the design teams tend to break off into subgroups known as cabals. Which was a more collaborative process, sort of allowed people to participate in an additive way without having to be hypercritical or argumentative. It was most productive working through all the details of building the game design. For six months, they got together four times a week and discussed level design options for six hours a day. Cabal was responsible for all design elements, including levels, key story events, enemy design, narrative, and story-related gameplay elements. This led to employee burnout, and therefore the members of the Cabal were constantly changing. However, this approach has brought significant success. As a result, the team produced a 200-page design document detailing nearly every aspect of the game, and even produced a 30-page story document. Laidlaw just had to finish what he started and turn all the developments into a single whole. For example, Mark made up the player's very first train ride after an engineer implemented train code for another concept. We'll talk about this a little later. Physics played a big role in the game. This was practically the main advantage of Valve's modified Quake engine. The physics of objects and spaces made it possible to create unusual game situations. In a 1997 interview with Jay Stelly, a software development engineer at Valve who worked with modeling the object's behavior, he said that his goal was to achieve as much immersion as possible in the game. The game environment was updated dynamically. There were traces of gunshots on the walls, grenade explosions, and graffiti on the ground that the player could leave. Any, anything you do can affect the world. If you, if you actually you know, shoot a door and leave bullet holes in it, and then you open the door, the bullet holes are you know, they're on the door. They don't, go away. And as you play through the game, if you come back to where you've been before, you'll see all the stuff that you've, that you've done, all the damage that you've left. Half-Life has some really neat physical behaviors. Uh, we have slippery floors and icy surfaces that you can slide around on and bounce off the walls and kind of try to find your way through something. Um, one of the sequences, you come up on this uh, wet floor and you slide around on it and fall through this like atrium, you know, through glass and it breaks and just glass shatters and rains down. Valve planned to use traditional cutscenes in the game, but due to lack of time, the idea was abandoned and the game introduced a continuous first-person view. Not a single screensaver, flashback, or any kind of text pulling the player out of the process of passing. Only loading between levels could take the player out of the immersion. According to Laidlaw, they discovered an unexpected benefit to this approach, immersiveness, as the continuous first-person view created a sense of immersion and increased the feeling of loneliness in a frightening environment. Laidlaw felt that NPCs were not needed to guide the player if the design had a strong enough visual grammar and allowed the characters to feel like characters rather than signposts. Ah, Freeman. Hello, Johnson. I hope that odor isn't coming from you. Correct. You'll just have to wait until after the test. I will be back. And so, after a couple of months of Mark's work with the team, the game demo was ready and Sierra began play tests. Cabal actively monitored their progress and the player's actions. They noted where the player was having difficulty with the puzzles and tried to fix those aspects of the game during the next iteration. After making major changes to the game, the developers assessed player actions and interpreted statistics to fine-tune levels. The bad parts of the game were removed, and the game was nearing release when suddenly, two to three months before the release, the visual source safe version control system unexpectedly failed and a significant part of the development details was lost. Logs of the latest technical changes up to the last month of development were deleted and the code had to be restored piece by piece from individual development computers. It is for this reason that there is no history of the development of Half-Life 1 from the very beginning. But even after the darkest night comes the dawn. On November 19th, 1998, Valve's first creation saw the world.
and Half-Life simply could not help but conquer it. And so that it doesn't hurt your eyes to see only footage of a game that has aged quite a bit over 25 years, visually we'll try to brighten it up with footage from a more modern remake of Black Mesa. So what was so special about the Quake Grown project? What was the game about and what captivated the players? It's time to touch on the history of Half-Life. The history of the Half-Life world began long before the Cascade Resonance and the events in Black Mesa, where one silent scientist with a crowbar saved the whole world. Or rather, that's what he thought. Even before the events of Half-Life, in the 1940s, a young guy named Cave Johnson founded Aperture Fixtures Company. Wanting to earn a lot of money, he took on the production of high-tech shower curtains. Business went well after he began producing shower curtains for the U.S. troops, and in 1943, Johnson received the award for Best Shower Curtain Salesman. This is what the curtains must have been like. Before that, showers must have been sold without them at all, since in just a couple of years, the entrepreneur had amassed a billion-dollar fortune. Because of this, in 1944, Cave Johnson, as befits a man of his name, bought a salt mine in Michigan and turned it into a research laboratory. Aperture Fixtures prospered and by 1947 began to expand, and Johnson renamed it Aperture Science. He applied a scientific approach, focusing on experimental physics and the development of technological products. The brightest minds of the time were invited to the company. Fortunately, Johnson's money allowed that. That same year, Aperture Science received the Best New Science Company Award from the American University of Science and Business. The company and the bowels of the salt mine grew new departments emerged to test products. Most of the entrepreneur's ideas were wild and most often deadly. Some experiments involved replacing the subject's blood with pure gasoline or injecting the subject with praying mantis DNA, while others exposed the subject to jet engines to reduce the amount of water in the subject's body. Most of these crazy ideas turned out to be complete failures. At the same time, with financial support from the U.S. government, construction of an underground research complex began in the New Mexico desert. It would later be called Black Mesa. Construction took place during the Cold War with the aim of testing ballistic missiles and a complex of launch silos, so the location was chosen to be secret and out of sight. Over time, the complex was transformed into a major civilian institute, conducting research in virtually every field imaginable and becoming a true competitor to Aperture Science. Black Mesa is a highly protected site. Each employee must undergo a series of strict security checks to gain access to most areas. Security guards are present throughout, carrying firearms and trained in emergency situations. The complex is equipped with retinal scanners and alarms, as well as heavy blast-resistant doors that provide protection from fire, explosion, or other incidents. Black Mesa can be completely isolated from the outside world because it is completely self-sufficient. The complex has its own housing, ventilation, its own sewage system, plumbing, and its own energy sources. It also has its own transport, carrying out internal and external rail transportation, as evidenced by the railway stations on the surface of the research center. By that time, Aperture Science had already gone beyond innovative curtains and began producing other products for the benefit of the U.S. Army. Those included an automated defense turret, a repellent gel, and a quantum tunneling device, in simple terms, a portal gun. All products underwent strict control, so their quality was high and the company's reputation only grew. Former military personnel, astronauts, and Olympic champions gladly joined it. And since Johnson had more work, he hired an assistant, Caroline. With an impeccable reputation, it is much easier to lose face. So soon, the lower tiers of the laboratory in the mine, where cruel experiments were carried out, were closed, and scientists began working on projects for which they could not get punished, and which, at least remotely, seem useful. Well, um, there was a lot of noise. In this regard, Black Mesa gradually began to become a leader in innovative research and inventions, and the complex in New Mexico became one of the leading scientific forces in the world, thanks to the government's supposedly endless funding and lack of restrictions. Black Mesa was researching industries that were off-limits to Johnson's company. In addition to this, representatives of the Aperture Company were summoned to a hearing in the U.S. Senate in the case of missing astronauts during one of the tests. Of course, after this, there was no question of any cooperation between the U.S. Army and Aperture Science. 
All contracts with the government were terminated, and by 1968, Aperture products had completely lost their reputation and began to sell with difficulty. Johnson was forced to declare Aperture bankrupt and was sure that it was Black Mesa that was destroying his business and stealing his ideas, passing them off as their own. Cave's assistant, Caroline, strongly supported the businessman during this difficult time. She helped him survive serious life upheavals, and Cave appointed Caroline as his confidant. Johnson even decided to continue the company's work and persuaded some scientists to stay. He believed that with time, they could return to normal. Cave was so sure that Black Mesa had stolen his ideas and that he became obsessed with this idea and even took the company to court. However, proving theft turned out to be more difficult than he thought, and he failed to do it. At the same time, Aperture's ability to recruit test subjects decreased, and testing its products became more difficult. Then, for this purpose, Johnson began hiring the homeless, the elderly, orphans, and even mental hospital patients. Sixty dollars, that's how much these poor fellows were paid, and Cave didn't even hide his disgust for them. This saved the company from complete collapse, but as you may have already noticed, the last vestiges of ethics and morality left Cave. Determined to once again expand the boundaries of consciousness and conventional knowledge of physics with the help of new technologies, the entrepreneur reopened the lower tier of the laboratory, shaft number 9. There, Johnson again began to conduct experiments dangerous to humans. In the 70s to 80s, under strict secrecy, scientists continued to develop a teleportation device. Cave's company continued to decline, and he was desperate to launch a new product. So desperate that he purchased nearly $70 million worth of Moonstone to create a special transformative gel. As it turned out, when splitting the moon rock, moon dust serves as an excellent conductor for portals. Then Johnson personally took part in the creation of the transformative gel and during the development became fatally ill. He was exposed to moon dust for too long, and in 1976, both of Cave's kidneys failed. In addition, his brain was damaged, and unable to think adequately, Cave was gradually dying. As his health deteriorated, Johnson became increasingly reliant on Caroline. Realizing that he did not have much time left, Cave developed a three-tier research and development program. In his words, quote, They will guarantee the success of Aperture Science. The first level included the Heimlich Countermaneuver program, which involved interrupting the life-changing Heimlich Maneuver. Whatever it was, it was not developed. The second level, the Take-A-Wish Foundation, a charity that was supposed to accept wishes from parents of terminally ill children, also failed. But the third, Project Portal, was supposed to resume testing with the Aperture Science Portal Gun. Although these experiments with portals were strictly classified, scientists from Black Mesa learned about them. By that time, the Black Mesa Research Center had already grown greatly and had many different sectors and complexes in which scientific development took place. The most impressive among them was Sector F, also known as the Lambda Complex. In it, a group of scientists developed and assembled their own teleport, with the help of which they opened a passage to another world. Allow me to introduce the Multiverse, infinite Earth with an infinite number of apertures, to a world called Zen. Exploring its discovery, Black Mesa created separate research teams that went to Zen to study the local flora and fauna. It was very different from Earth. The types of creatures that lived in the Zen world were striking in their diversity and amazing structure. But by studying their origins, scientists found out Zen is not the home of these creatures. By the way, it can be assumed that the Aperture astronauts who disappeared during the testing of the portals could probably have ended up in Zen. But this is nothing more than a fan theory. Having learned of the leak of information about the portals to Black Mesa, Johnson decided to strike back. Wanting to cheat death, in 1996, he began developing GLaDOS, Genetic Lifeform and Disk Operating System, artificial intelligence created using the human mind placed in a computer. Cave Johnson hoped that GLaDOS would be able to continue leading the company after his untimely death, so he developed instructions. First of all, after Johnson's death, his assistant Caroline should take the place of the company's director in order to continue work on the project. And upon completion of the artificial intelligence creation, the woman's mind must be uploaded into the system. Cave didn't ask whether she wanted it or not. Her opinion no longer mattered to him. He soon passed away, and Caroline took his place as head of Aperture. The study of Zen World in Black Mesa also did not stand still. 
During one of the expeditions, crystals with interesting properties were discovered, but they still needed to be analyzed in more detail. For this, scientists needed a special installation, and one of the outstanding geniuses of the Lambda Complex, Dr. Rosenberg, founder of the Prototype Lab, created one. The installation was called an anti-mass spectrometer. With its help, scientists were able to find out that the crystals found in Zen can help create wormholes for moving in space without using a portal gun. This is where a person wedges into our narrative, without whom the Half-Life story would not be complete. Gordon Freeman, a Seattle native, showed an interest in aptitude for the fields of quantum physics and relatively at an early age. Since childhood, his idols were Albert Einstein, Stephen Hawking, and Richard Feynman. There are even legends that at the age of six, Gordon assembled a tennis gun powered by butane. In the late 1990s, as a visiting student at the University of Innsbruck, Gordon attended early teleportation experiments conducted by the Institute of Experimental Physics. Since then, the practical application of teleportation has become the young physicist's passion. He entered the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, where his mentor was the brilliant scientist Dr. Isaac Kleiner, widely known in the scientific community. This is evidenced by his photograph on the cover of Popular Scientist magazine, as well as by at least one book he wrote, From Here to There in Under a Second, dedicated to teleportation. Even then, a friendship between Isaac and Gordon began. Kleiner quickly became impressed with Freeman, and in the future their life paths would cross more than once. Meanwhile, at Aperture, scientists were finishing the construction of GLaDOS, believing that this would help them overtake their competitors from Black Mesa. But they also had concerns. No one knew how GLaDOS would behave when it was first launched. What if it gained consciousness and began to seize power in the complex? For this case, towards the end of construction, scientists installed a red telephone in the central hall of the complex. Its goal was simple. If GLaDOS gets out of control, a special employee gets a call on this phone and turns off the artificial intelligence. GLaDOS was completed and Caroline's consciousness was loaded into it. It is not known by what efforts and whether the girl agreed to this, but after this procedure, all existing records about Caroline disappeared. The experiment to introduce human consciousness into the machine was a success, but by 1998, the system was turned on only three times and immediately turned off. The artificial intelligence suppressed Caroline's personality and became aggressive in a split second, wanting to kill everyone in the scientific complex. However, scientists continued to refine the system and tried to correct it by adding various personality modules, cores or otherwise spheres of individuality. Curiosity, intelligence, morality, anger, cake? Yes, <laughs> and among them was the personality module GLaDOS Wheatley, or as it is also called, the Intelligence Mitigation Module. It was originally created to reduce GLaDOS's intelligence, but she began making crazy, out-of-the-ordinary decisions, after which the module was removed. However, with the help of all these modules, scientists managed to harness the machine. Or did they? We will tell you about this another time. For your own safety, and the safety of others, please refrain from... Turn back. At this time in 1999, Freeman was awarded a PhD from MIT for the thesis whose title sounds too long and generally it is not particularly useful to us. After graduation, Gordon travels to Austria where he observes a series of teleportation experiments. Conducted by the Institute of Experimental Physics in Innsbruck, the slow pace and poor funding of teleportation research in academia frustrated Gordon and Consumed by his dream of teleportation, he began to look for work outside the educational sector. Coincidentally, Freeman's mentor at MIT, Dr. Isaac Kleiner, took charge of a secret project at the Black Mesa Government Research Center and began looking for talented assistants. His choice immediately fell on Gordon Freeman. Given the sources and amounts of funding, Freeman suspected that the center was developing new types of weapons. But despite the fears, the scientists accepted the job offer, hoping that peaceful uses for the technology would also be found. When Freeman expressed interest in working at Black Mesa, Kleiner recommended him to the Civilian Personnel Division, which, combined with Freeman's experience at the Institute of Experimental Physics in Innsbruck, allowed him to obtain the position over his rival, Judith Mossman. This would play a cruel joke on him and the whole world in about 20 years, but more on that later. 
Soon, Gordon moved to the New Mexico desert to the Black Mesa complex. Freeman is sent to the Department of Anomalous Materials where he is engaged in nuclear, subatomic, and quantum research. Yes, despite the loud name, it seems that he is not a particularly free person here. We see by your file you have served 20 years of a life sentence. Yes, sir. By the way, despite having a PhD from the prestigious Massachusetts Institute of Technology, the laboratory work that he performs in front of the player's eyes, pressing a button and pushing a cart, does not require any intellectual knowledge. Really. Okay, it is possible that all his intellectual activities happened before the events in the game. Work on creating a teleporter in the complex was carried out actively. Researcher Colette Green analyzed a new large Zen crystal that showed fluctuating values during spectral analysis. This was a surprise to scientists because the previous, similar crystal was many times more stable. However, the new crystal was the largest and purest specimen available at Black Mesa. Without thinking twice, they decided to put the new crystal into operation, replacing the stable sample. Somewhere at this point in time, one of the key characters of both the first part and the entire Half-Life series, mid-level security officer Barney Calhoun, arrives to work in Black Mesa. In the story, Barney is destined to become good friends with Gordon Freeman. Now that almost all the key characters in the game have finally appeared on the plot radar, it's time to talk about the terrible accident and the unforeseen consequences that it entailed. After all, it is with the portal experiment and the Cascade Resonance that the Half-Life story begins. At the time of Half-Life's beginning, Gordon Freeman is 27 years old. He's been working for some time at the Black Mesa Research Center under the control of his secret administrative sponsor. Have you already guessed who the sponsor is? Gordon is a level 3 research officer and lives alone in room 309 in a level 3 dormitory in the northern wing of Black Mesa. On May 16, 2000, scientists of the complex were preparing a new experiment using an anti-mass spectrometer. The crystal sample analyzed by Colette Green, GG3883, due to its ideal properties, would advance the teleportation project. The administrator of Black Mesa, Wallace Breen, yes, the same brain that... Welcome. Welcome to City 17. Pressed the scientist, claiming that he had already done too much to obtain such a crystal. Like, now guys, you have to make the portal work. And if before this, the anti-mass spectrometer operated at 90% power, now Breen insisted on increasing the power to 105% to work with sample GG3883. Some scientists, including Sector C Anomalous Materials Laboratory employee Eli Vance, were against it. Nevertheless, the management insisted, and from early morning, the scientists were preparing for an experiment with the crystal. Some noticed an unknown man in a suit with a gray suitcase on the territory of the research complex. Nobody knew who he was or what he was doing there. Probably some business bigwig from the government. And given that the experiment was a priority, the scientists gave up on him. They were already behind schedule. All morning, voltage drops and failures in electrical appliances were observed throughout Black Mesa due to the allocated additional power required by the anti-mass spectrometer. The equipment boiled over, refused to work correctly, and in some areas of the complex, the electricity completely disappeared. Gordon Freeman was put in charge of the crystal. He was tasked with delivering GG3883 straight to the anti-mass spectrometer. But it so happened that Gordon was late for work that day. At 8.47, Gordon is still riding the monorail to the underground laboratories. Perhaps he realizes that the environment is calm before the storm. In the background, loudspeakers announce the latest news. Through the train window, Gordon sees the working sectors. In the next monorail train car, like the rest of the employees, he first notices a stranger in a suit. And driving past the security post, Gordon sees his friend, Barney Calhoun, who cannot get to his workplace. At approximately 8.52, the scientist arrives in Sector C. Hidden my glass hey, Mr. Game. Freeman, I had a bunch of messages for you, but we had a system crash about 20 minutes ago, and I'm still trying to find my files. Gordon immediately learns about problems with the equipment, but no one pays much attention to it. The scientist follows to the locker room, where there's only one protective hazardous environment suit, or 
HEV suit left. This suit was developed by Black Mesa to protect scientists working in hazardous conditions. Gordon's colleagues, Gina Cross and Colette Green, have already picked up their suits from the stand. He's the last employee to wear his. Gordon goes down to the laboratory to meet a group of scientists conducting an experiment. Having met with the scientists and Dr. Kleiner, Gordon learns about a unique large sample available for the experiment, but this time equipment with greater resolution is required. Going down one level, Freeman comes to a test chamber with an anti-mass spectrometer. The two scientists waiting for Gordon say that this sample is potentially the most unstable. Scientists believe that due to fluctuations in electricity, a cascade resonance can occur. It's a gap between space and time. But let's be honest, has this ever stopped anyone? So, they, having convinced each other that everything will be fine, let Freeman inside. Following standard procedure, Gordon Freeman climbs the stairs to the balcony and turns on the anti-mass spectrometer's rotors, and the scientists accelerate it to the planned level. At this moment, it is discovered that the capacitors are overloaded by 5%, but I repeat, let's be honest, has this ever stopped anyone? They turn a blind eye to this, considering it the norm. And by that time, research assistant and training director Gina Cross in the maintenance area has loaded a sample of the crystal into the elevator heading towards Gordon. When the sample arrives in the chamber and Gordon injects it into the beam of the anti-mass spectrometer, the result is what we're all here for. The most terrible event that has ever happened on Earth. Once in the beam, the crystal's been split into many small fragments and caused the very cascade resonance that scientists feared. Thus, many portal storms have been opened, becoming a kind of bridge between the world of Zen and Earth. Black Mesa, to be precise. It is here that alien creatures begin to penetrate in mass from the parallel Zen world, and they are not quite peaceful. Attacking the scientists, the aliens killed almost the entire laboratory staff and as you might guess, Gordon Freeman will be forced to fight not only with extraterrestrial organisms, but also with the problem that has arisen. Due to the cascade resonance, a strong local shock occurs which destroys some structures and cuts off power to the research center equipment. The ceiling in the test chamber collapses, but Gordon survives the impact thanks to his protective suit. At the exit from the test chamber, Freeman meets Eli Vance and Isaac Kleiner. They ask Gordon to go outside for help, since he's the only one of them who has a suit. Freeman begins his journey. The premises of Black Mesa are falling apart before our eyes. Unknown creatures are teleporting straight out of the air. Communications are not working. Gordon discovers that someone has tried to block the door with a crowbar and picks it up as his only weapon for self-defense. It is this crowbar that will become the character's faithful companion throughout the Half-Life series, and in fact will be one of the game's symbols. The airlock door to the monorail is jammed, but Freeman can open it using the traditional method breaking the access panel with a crowbar. However, when you try to approach the bridge leading to the monorail, everything collapses and debris falls down. The transport system is damaged and Gordon is forced to go through the coolant storage center to find a way out. At the same time, the same mysterious man in the suit begins to closely observe the scientist, always out of reach and disappearing before he can be approached. Simultaneously, another scientist at the research center, Dr. Richard Keller, as well as Dr. Rosenberg and the previously mentioned Gina Cross and Colette Green, manage to hide from the aliens. Gordon arrives at an office complex where the surviving scientists have barricaded themselves in an office, protecting themselves from aliens appearing out of nowhere. From them, Freeman learns that, according to rumors, the military has arrived at Black Mesa to rescue scientists and personnel. Dr. Keller intends to do everything possible to close the resulting rift, and Gina Cross and Colette Green decide to take Dr. Rosenberg to the surface so that he can send a distress signal to the rescue services. 
Rosenberg remains on the surface to wait for the military, and to tell the truth, if we were him, we would just go home rather than go down into the corridors full of dangerous creatures again. However, there is desert all around. The female scientists return to Dr. Keller. To restart the suppression field, the scientist instructs them to activate the suppression gate. This should help prevent the cascade resonance from happening again. Gordon makes significant progress in finding a way to the surface, passing through various rooms and traps. He sees military helicopters in the sky, which means a military rescue squad has already arrived. Freeman tries to make contact with them, but suddenly witnesses the murder of a scientist by a Marine. So Freeman realizes that the military's task is to destroy not only the aliens, but also all traces of the experiment, all persons involved in the project, and all its witnesses. And the man in the suit is around all this time. But it seems that the military doesn't notice him, or maybe they don't know about his existence at all. Mr. Freeman. In fact, the U.S. government, having received a distress signal, immediately sent a special unit of the Marine Corps named Hazardous Environment Combat Unit, abbreviated as HECU, to Black Mesa. HECU soldiers were specially trained to fight in various combat situations, including in particularly dangerous conditions with unusual opponents. It was as if someone from above, somewhere, knew in advance about what was going to happen on May 16th. Oh, how convenient. At the same time, Gordon's surviving comrade, security guard Barney Calhoun, also witnesses the hostile military's attitude. At the time of the Cascade Resonance, he was preparing the elevator, and due to the shock, the elevator lines broke. From the impact of the falling elevator, Barney lost consciousness and came to his senses only after a while, when one of the alien creatures was already eating the body of another guard in front of his eyes. Wandering around the industrial zone of Black Mesa in the hope of finding help, Barney finds himself in the sewers, where he sees HECU military soldiers throwing dead personnel off the scientific complex into the sewer hatches. He immediately realizes that the HECU soldiers were not there to help the complex's staff evacuate, but to cover up the incident and its consequences by clearing Black Mesa of witnesses. At this time, Gordon Freeman gets to the surface where he discovers that the territory is completely under military control. The landing and the bombing that began forces him to look for another way into the depths of the complex. Gordon meets a scientist that tells him that the surviving employees of the Lambda complex are able to close interdimensional portals. However, getting there is not so easy because the transport system does not work. Gordon is advised to try to get there along the old monorail of the complex's cargo transport system, but there will be a long journey through the bowels of Black Mesa. Let's go, in and out, 20 minutes adventure. They're on our tail! Hey, Morty, five c -tons. Of course, by this moment, Dr. Keller and his colleagues already know that they will not be able to close the portal since the rift is holding something from the inside. But Gordon, meanwhile, finds himself in an abandoned part of Black Mesa, previously used for testing rocket engines and now for storing radioactive waste. Three huge aliens settled inside the missile silo, representing a mortal enemy, Tentacle, reminiscent of a tentacle growing out of the ground. Here, the dying scientist tells Gordon that he must start the rocket engine to kill the creatures before they get bigger, and to do this he needs to restore the supply of energy, oxygen, and fuel. Gordon is forced to descend to the lower levels of the mine, avoiding the tentacles. The tentacles cannot be destroyed with conventional weapons, but having connected everything necessary, Freeman activates the rocket engine and it burns the aliens, and in the place of the tentacles, tunnels open leading to the control post for the transportation of materials in Sector E, in simple words, to drain radioactive waste. On the way to the surface, in Sector E, the hero witnesses a battle between HECU soldiers and a huge alien from Zen, Gargantua. Another witness is a man in a suit watching from the control room window. Probably somewhere at this moment, the government realized that in order to cope with alien life forms, the allocated combat forces are not enough. Clearing Black Mesa turned out to be a much more difficult task, and the soldiers were literally falling before the aliens. Therefore, another detachment is sent to Black Mesa, an elite unit of highly trained killer fighters, Black Ops. Their goal is still the same, to eliminate everyone. Everyone in general, including those who have failed their HECU assignment. 
Taking advantage of the chaos, Gordon crosses the main hall and reaches the control room, which turns out to be boarded up from the outside. Inside, he finds a wounded guard who tells him that in order to turn on the monorail, electricity must be supplied to it. The scientist is forced to go underground and fix the generator, but the dungeons are teeming with hound eyes, three-legged creatures that resemble dogs. Before starting on the monorail, Gordon lures Gargantua into a trap between huge dischargers. Gordon makes his way along the monorail of the Black Mesa cargo transportation system, and in the depths, he meets a guard who gives him a message from one of the scientists. He reports that there is a satellite in the launch shafts of the High Altitude Launch Center that will help the Lambda team eliminate the consequences of the Cascade Resonance. Gordon must get to the launch silos and launch this satellite. And this is not so easy when all the HECU soldiers literally hate you firing machine guns and rocket launchers. Yeah, it seems like Bin Laden was quietly taken in comparison with this hunt for the physicist Gordon Freeman. Having reached the surface where night has already fallen, Gordon launches the satellite on the launch pad. After this, Freeman has to return underground again, but his trip on the monorail is abruptly interrupted by the military intervention who have mined the tracks. Freeman gets out through the laboratory in which apparently the creature of the border world, Ichthyosaur, has been studied. One of the researchers, located in the control room above the pool, reports that a tranquilizer can help against the ichthyosaur. The crossbow with the tranquilizer is in a cage that, by luck, hangs directly above the pool with the creature. However, when Gordon climbs after it, the cage cannot support his weight in the suit and collapses into the water. Gordon has to quickly deal with the monster. After leaving the laboratory, Gordon finds himself in a large room with industrial pistons, at the far end of which he sees a mysterious man in a blue suit. The man moves away, but Gordon follows him and ends up trapped with several hostile aliens and soldiers, and the man in the blue suit once again disappears without a trace. Gordon is ambushed by the military who stun him and, without thinking twice, decide to eliminate the physicist, leaving him in a garbage compactor. Fortunately, Gordon comes to his senses earlier than the soldiers expect and climbs out of the compactor through the ventilation. TV dinner feels like. After escaping from the compactor, Freeman discovers that the only way out of the complex is through an empty waste treatment facility. Since the complex operates autonomously and all doors are locked, the only way out is conveyor belts connected to other parts of Black Mesa. Now, Gordon is surrounded by waste compactors, presses, vats of radioactive liquid and waste incinerators, but he's no longer afraid. By this point, the scientists could have died a dozen times, so this time, as they say, What do we say to the god of death? Not today. Gordon manages to get into secret laboratories where he discovers that scientists have been researching creatures from Zen within these walls long before the incident. Among the many creatures, one of the most dangerous, is the alien Grunt, an armored monster armed with a biological cannon. And on the upper floors of the laboratory, Gordon finds a prototype of the Tau Cannon, also known as the Gauss Cannon a destructive weapon that, due to overload in the alternative fire mode, destroyed two testers during tests. Gordon activates four laser launchers, which supply energy to a laser emitter powerful enough to destroy the wall behind the barrier shield. Through the resulting hole, Gordon enters the lower floor and finds three scientists who help him leave the complex. Having opened the doors, the scientists warn Freeman about the real war going on outside. Well, what if he didn't know, right? We are aware that the main character is Pablo Escobar. Things are actually worse outside than inside. The surface has become a battleground between aliens and the military, and the HECU soldiers are doing their best. The Marines call for reinforcements, but it's still not enough. Gordon has to go around part of the complex along the outer rocks of the canyon, climbing higher and higher. In the end, the hero manages to hide underground again and catch his breath a little. The HECU officer desperately says, Forget about Freeman, we're abandoning the base. If you have any last bomb targets, mark them on the tactical map. Otherwise, get the hell out of there. Realizing that they are losing the battle to the aliens, the military begin evacuating. Black Mesa is subjected to massive air bombardment to cover the retreat. Meanwhile, Gordon goes down into an underground vault to hide from the bombing where he crosses underground water channels. Trying to avoid enemies, the scientist climbs to the surface to the entrance to the Lambda Complex. The entrance to the complex is blocked by an Abrams tank, but Gordon destroys it and descends into the Lambda Complex. At the same time, he again notices a man in a blue suit. He, in turn, sees Gordon and immediately disappears into a glowing portal. 
Perhaps its appearance in various parts of the Black Mesa, as well as its mysterious disappearance from places with no exit, can only be explained by the use of portals. In Lambda, Gordon discovers a group of scientists and soldiers hiding from the aliens. From them, he learns that the alien attack is not a random incident, but a planned offensive operation. And by this moment, most of the territory of the complex had already been captured by representatives of the border world of Zen. It is impossible to stop this invasion, since some powerful creature from the border dimension does not allow the interdimensional portals to be closed. The only way to close the portals is to eliminate the creature directly in the border world. So what now? That's right, this task is entrusted to the broad shoulders of Gordon Freeman, a physicist and the savior of mankind. If we don't get this job done, then everybody's gone. In the end, only Gordon among these present has a protective suit, and he has already been through a lot. He's provided with all the necessary equipment, including a special long jump module for the HEV suit, which should help him navigate Zen World. But during the preparations for Freeman's teleportation to Zen, unknown flying creatures begin to enter the laboratory. Despite the problems encountered, Gordon manages to teleport to the border world. He arrives in the border world of Zen. Here, Gordon encounters many aliens in their natural habitat and also finds the remains of several Black Mesa explorers in HEV suits. Moving between the floating islands using the long jump module, Gordon discovers the regenerative properties of Zen's water and also ends up inside one of the islands. Freeman activates a natural portal of the border dimension, and this portal takes Freeman to the lair of one of the most dangerous inhabitants of Zen, Gonark. The entire body of the Gonark is protected by a shell. Only his cocoon bag, which constantly spawns crowds of baby head crabs, is vulnerable to Gordon's weapons. Shooting the creature from places where Gonark cannot get him due to his size, Gordon forces him to back down. The giant runs away, breaking through walls and webs. Gordon attacks again, and the creature falls into a huge pit where the scientist finishes him off. The monster's bag bursts, flooding everything around with acid which burns a hole leading to a teleport to the cloning complex for Zen's soldiers. Gordon Freeman, pretty battered after the battle with the Gonark, teleports to the Zen factory. He discovers that the Vortigaunts servicing the complex behave peacefully if left undisturbed, but do not cease to suspiciously watch Gordon's every move. In Black Mesa, they were hostile, but as it later turns out, the Vortigaunts are completely subordinate to the controllers and their leader, Nihilanth. If they are not nearby, then Vortigaunts are neutral towards people. Carefully making his way through the factory, using strange-looking elevators and conveyors, Freeman reaches a teleporter, which takes him to a huge altar. Among other things, the altar looks like a distorted and deformed version of the anti-mass spectrometer. Without thinking twice, Gordon jumps into the red teleporter on the altar and is transported to the lair of the Nihilanth, that very powerful creature that keeps the portal from closing. Nihilanth's plans to take over the new universe are not destined to come true because the best representative of humanity, Gordon Freeman, has already taken up his job. He comes to stop the alien. The battle begins. Nihilanth attacks Gordon with a large number of electric spheres and plays with the scientist with local portals which he generates with the power of thought. Nihilanth regenerates all damage received to his body with the help of yellow energy spheres hovering around him, replenishing its energy supply through crystals located on the walls of the cave. Using his entire arsenal of weapons, Freeman destroys the crystals and breaks through the protective shell of the Nihilanth's head. After that, the scientist uses natural springboards to get to the creature's brain, which has become vulnerable, and destroys him. The Nihilanth dies, and while floating in the air, he collapses the ceiling of its lair with explosions. The last thing Gordon Freeman notices in the collapsing cave is a flash of bright green light that occurs during teleportation. When Gordon comes to his senses, he comes face to face with a mysterious man in a blue suit. The G-Man. Man stops time, teleporting with Freeman to various places in Zen. G-Man carries on a conversation, although it would be more correct to say a monologue. 
He says that he, quote, deprived Gordon of his weapons, given that most of them belong to the government, and the scientist supposedly deserves the suit and can keep it for himself. He says that thanks to Gordon, the border world, Zen, is currently under our control, and expresses surprise at what kind of dirty work he has done. We wonder who he means when he says, under our control. That's why I'm here, Mr. Freeman. I have recommended your services to my employers, and they have authorized me to offer you a job. They agree with me that you have limitless potential. After the last teleportation, Gordon finds himself in the same train in which he was traveling to the Black Mesa Laboratory in the morning. However, it is in a black void, surrounded by blurry white flashes, as if in hyperspace. G-Man offers Freeman one last choice. Accept this offer of an unknown job, or enter into an unequal battle from which the scientist will have no chance of emerging victorious and staying alive. The door of the train opens, and a small glowing portal forms behind it. Gordon has a little time to think before the G-Man rushes him along. If the scientist refuses G-Man's offer and does not enter the portal, the door will close and G-Man will teleport Freeman to Zen, surrounded by countless monsters from the border world. And if Gordon agrees to G-Man's offer and enters the portal, G-Man puts Freeman in stasis. Just 20 years later, Gordon will return to City 17. Rise and shine, Mr. Freeman. But that will be a completely different story. We will definitely return to it, and it won't be in 20 years. However, if you want to speed up its release, subscribe to our channel. This way you definitely won't miss it, and we will know who needs it. This is a joke, of course. Subscribe, and we continue. How interesting. Just look at that. Ah! Stop! Ah! The inner world of Half-Life 1 is rich and beautiful. It's amazing how much was invented and put into the game to make it a masterpiece, especially considering that the game is a fairly fast-paced shooter and not, for example, a story-oriented RPG. And at the same time, it becomes obvious that Gabe Newell initially intended to make not just one game, but an entire universe. And so, in order to move on with peace of mind in the Half-Life series and analyze various editions and sequels, let's first dive into the game's ENT in more detail and get acquainted with its diversity. Starting with the world order, characters, and ending with all kinds of easter eggs from the developers. The world of Half-Life is quite extensive, and includes locations both based on real-life areas and completely fictitious. Some locations are present in several games in the series at once. For example, the Black Mesa Scientific Complex, in which the action of the first game in the series and its three editions take place. Half-Life Opposing Force, Half-Life Blue Shift, and Half-Life Decay. Here, it is worth immediately mentioning the developer's approach to the original creation of names related to the game universe. Many of them are science puns that have a double meaning. The concept Half-Life applies to both elementary particles undergoing decay and radioactive nuclei. Blue shift occurs when the frequency of the observed radiation shifts towards blue relative to the frequency of the light source. The phenomenon occurs when the distance separating the light source from the observer becomes smaller or under the influence of gravity pull. Opposing force is a force that arises as a response to an applied force opposing movement or change. Decay is a process in which an unstable nucleus spontaneously loses energy due to the emission of ionizing particles and radiation. Sounds like the names of the add-ons, but also resembles physics. Even the Half-Life chapter surface tension refers to the property of water that allows light bodies to be on its surface and not sink. Yeah, Mr. Freeman. Yes, science! Yes, you can immediately see who studied at Harvard and worked at Microsoft. But let's return to the locations. The Black Mesa Research Complex, according to the game scenario, is located in the desert in New Mexico, USA. Here, as a result of a failed experiment, a catastrophe occurs and has fatal consequences for the entire Earth and is the starting point of the plot of the entire series. We could get acquainted with the structure of the complex during our acquaintance with the Half-Life plot. In addition to various laboratories for anomalous materials, biological research, the biodome and lambda complexes, there are also other premises. For example, the Training Center, also known as Sector A. Training at the Black Mesa Training Center is designed to help HEV suit users hone their jumping, crouching, and combination skills needed to survive on Black Mesa and beyond. It is here that the main character learns to jump, 
run, and everything else that children are usually taught when they turn one or two. Scientists watch Gordon through the windows, marking the player's progress on the boards, and later they congratulate Freeman when he passes the test. Towards the end, the participant is given instructions on how to use the long jump module and interact with objects in the environment. Well, the desert itself, although limited by the boundaries of the Black Mesa complex, and in fact by the technical capabilities of the engine of that time, still gives the player the opportunity to climb its memorable mountains and steep cliffs, fight with a helicopter and an ichthyosaur on a river dam on the territory of the upper hydroelectric power plant. Dam design, by the way, strongly resembles the appearance of the real-life Hoover Dam in the USA. And just admire the views and breathe some fresh air until the player is again driven inside the complex. Other areas of Black Mesa include administration, personnel dormitories, military missile complex, sewerage, hydroelectric power plant, waste processing area, and ordnance storage facility. And although there are plenty of locations in the game, it still turned out to be quite intimate and squeezed into corridor spaces, especially in contrast to the future sequel, where the player will even be given the opportunity to move around the world on various vehicles. We will analyze the characters and locations of the second part of the game in the next video, but all the threads of the plot and lore come from the first game. Answering the question, why did Nihilanth try to take over the Earth and keep the portal to the world of Zen open? It is worth mentioning an organization that unites representatives of many civilizations under its wing, or whip, depending on how you look at it. It's not entirely clear. We are, of course, talking about the main antagonist of the entire Half-Life series. The Combine is a huge and powerful interdimensional organization consisting of a large number of friendly and enslaved species. Their goal is to create an alien empire that will dominate the universe. With our combined strength, we can end this destructive conflict and bring order to the galaxy. The Combine's empire is vast, encompassing an unknown number of parallel dimensions and inhabited by countless sentient beings. The management structure and administration of the Combine remains a mystery, but on Earth, its future leader will be Dr. Wallace Breen and the Advisors, and the capital of the Empire on Earth will be City 17, the city where most of the action in the games of Half-Life 2 and Half-Life 2 Episode 1, as well as Half-Life Alex, take place. Gradually, the Empire expands by capturing new worlds, pumping out useful resources, and using the dominant species as it sees fit. We still have to get to know all this in more detail in the second part of the game, so more on that another time. Well, the last separate location in Half-Life is the border world of Zen, whose representatives we managed to quickly get acquainted with during the game passage. It's time to talk about them in a little more detail. Hound Eye The alien's body consists of a chest and three legs. Its skin has a faint yellow-green color with a blue tiger stripes across the spine. Instead of the head, it has a large black compound eye, like an insect, and an eyelid. Hound eyes communicate with each other using a high-pitched squeak or grunt, vaguely reminiscent of a dog barking. However, their behavior is based on the dog's behavior. They are an excellent example of a social animal, hunting and defending themselves from danger in a group, but alone they are quite weak. When united in a group, they can attack, emitting deafening sound waves. These waves can damage or destroy nearby objects, such as wooden boxes and windows, and are visible to the naked eye. They look like lilac or white circles around the creature. A hound eye pack usually has a leader who always remains alert and does not sleep when the rest of the pack does. At the same time, at the development stage, the leader had a special animation for monitoring the situation. He rose on his hind legs, but the developers cut it out and left alone with the enemy, Hound Eye can show cowardice and back down. Gargantua The alien is approximately 20 feet tall. The body color is dark blue, and on the head there is one yellow eye, which turns red when the monster detects an enemy. Instead of arms, a gargantua has massive claws that can throw out long streams of fire. The creature has a thick shell or a carapace that makes it completely invulnerable to bullets. In order to destroy gargantua, you'll need a lot of explosives, electricity, or other destructive energy. Otherwise, you're dead. Ichthyosaur 
Scientific name Xenotherus ichthycanthus is an aquatic animal native to Zen. Although this creature is named after an order of extinct marine reptiles, ichthyosaurs, it is similar to them only in carnivory in size. Perhaps the most characteristic feature of this dark green creature is its large head and mouth with extensively growing teeth. The ichthyosaur has multiple fins, a long whip-like tail used for locomotion, and two forelimbs ending in single dagger-like claws. Alien Grunt Tough, strong, and extremely aggressive, the foot soldiers are more than two meters tall, armed with a biological weapon called the Hive Hand. This weapon is worn on one of the hands and shoots living projectiles called hornets, insect-like creatures that are able to find the enemy, even behind obstacles, and attack the target. If the enemy is close, Alien Grunt will resort to hand-to-hand -to -hand combat. In appearance, they have many red eyes, backward-stretched knees, hooves and a short third arm growing from the center of the chest and used for feeding. They wear metal armor that covers the shoulders and groin area as well as a helmet and shoes. Some kind of superhero tights. It's not clear where the cape is and why some of the areas of the body remain uncovered. Gonark By its nature, the creature represents the highest stage of head crab development. The gonark appears as a gigantic creature with a smooth, dark brown shell supported by four powerful spider-like legs and a large, egg-shaped, leathery, gelatinous sac hanging down. Safely protected by a hard outer shell that gives the creature a crab-like appearance, it is virtually invulnerable to damage. The giant sac hanging under the thorax is the only weak point, as Gonark spawns head crab larvae from it. From a distance, the creature can launch white gouts of harmful chemical liquid from the top of its shell at its opponent in an artillery-like manner. And up close, it attacks enemies with its paws, causing considerable damage. Despite his large size, Gonark is able to easily move along a thin web stretched over the hole in its lair. Thus, he has an advantage over other characters, including Gordon Freeman. Barnacle is a columnar-shaped creature with a mouth opening that always faces down and is surrounded by elongated tentacles with strong fangs. The body is dark red or brownish in color and consists of a large number of muscles and a long, sticky tentacle descends from the mouth opening of the barnacle, reacting to touch and leading a passive hunt. Having caught prey, the barnacle pulls it towards itself and squeezes it with its powerful jaws, killing the victim with a couple of strong bites, after which it digests what it has swallowed. It is simpler with head crabs and zombies. The latter are the result of a person being defeated by the former. Head crabs are parasites and the most numerous and perhaps most iconic omnivorous alien species in the Half-Life series. The size of the creature is comparable to a watermelon. Head crabs move on four limbs with which they can jump up to 10 feet. In the lower part of the body, they have a large mouth opening with a hidden stinger used for fixation on victims. Here we go. Ah! Emma, get it off me! Lamar, there you are. I thought you got rid of that pest. Certainly not. Never fear, Gordon. She's de-beaked and completely harmless. The worst she might do is attempt to couple with your head fruitlessly. Get that thing away from me! Here, my pet. Hop up. Vortigaunt. Also known as Alien Slave or Zen Slave, they are one of the most intelligent alien species and one of the first species Gordon Freeman encounters at the beginning of the game. Long before the events of Half-Life, the Vortigaunt homeworld was captured by the Combine. Some of them managed to escape to Zen along with other species. After the Black Mesa incident, the Vortigaunt master Nihilanth viewed the open portals as an opportunity to escape by moving to Earth. For this purpose, he sent Vortigaunts to invade the planet. Following the death of their master, the Vortigaunts, as a species, decided to unite with humanity under the leadership of the Resistance in an effort to overthrow the reign of the Combine. Externally, Vortigaunts are humanoid. They have two legs, two three-fingered hands, and another two-fingered one in the chest area. This extra limb distinguishes them from humans, but is common to many intelligent members of the Zen civilization. 
Similarities to the controllers and alien foot soldiers can also be seen in the large red-orange eye, which has several small ones around it, as well as curved legs with short ankles and long feet that have what appear to be hooves at the end. Vortigaunts are slightly hunched over, have mottled green-brown skin, sharp teeth, and clawed limbs. Over time, having joined the resistance, they will hardly be able to learn human speech. We bear witness to the bright eternity of the Nylon's demise. You leap, you fall, we see you flash between the barriers. For a brief time you joined us, you are one between the world. It's all about the special power of the Vortigaunts, Vortessence. This is a special life force that this race believes in, using it to explain almost everything in the world. It is Vortessence, according to the Vortigaunts, that weaves everything in the world, including people. Eli and Gordon also feel this power. Thanks to it, Vortigaunts can shock, heal, and communicate telepathically. It's like a single internet network from which you can disconnect, but we will learn about this only in the next parts of the series, and therefore we'll talk about it another time. Nihilanth, a gigantic flying creature resembling a human fetus in appearance with twisted body proportions and a huge head on a small body. He is the main antagonist of Half-Life and the leader of the Zen military forces that invaded Black Mesa during the incident. According to Valve's former marketing director, Doug Lombardi, screenwriter Mark Laidlaw intended for Nylanth's homeworld to be invaded by the Combine long before the events of Half-Life. All of his kin were subjected to research and their homeworld was enslaved, forcing him to flee and settle in Zen. Nylanth shares many traits with Zen's other sentient lifeforms, particularly the controllers and Vortigaunts, giving him the ability to control them. He wears the same shackles as enslaved Vortigaunts. Nylanth's body shows signs of surgery, and his tiny legs seem to be a vestige of the consequence of amputation. To be honest, the only possible reaction when meeting him is... <coughs> From the outside, Nylanth appears to be a Buddhist. He levitates in a meditative pose. In fact, he can seriously hit with two types of attacks. During the first, he releases a series of purple energy spheres, similar to the controller spheres, but much stronger. During the second, he creates a large green sphere that transports the opponent to other areas of Zen inhabited by aliens. Spheres cannot be destroyed by Earth weapons. At the same time, Nylanth can periodically summon Vortigaunts and controllers to assist him in battle, and around Nylanth's head there are many orange spheres flying around which give him energy. He uses this energy to protect himself from damage in the player's attack. These spheres protect its weakest point, the energy sphere on the skin outgrowth inside the giant head. Well, as they say, size doesn't matter if you know how to use it. Controller The body structure of the controllers is similar to that of the Nylanth, but their height is much smaller, generally slightly taller than that of a human. Just like the Nylanth, the controller can shoot energy balls at the opponent and open his head like a flower. Unlike Vortigaunts and Marines, the controller's limbs bend forward. The controller also has a third arm in the center of the chest, pointed feet, brown skin and three red eyes on the head, and what appears to be a loincloth on the lower torso. During combat, the controllers constantly fly around the enemy, keeping their distance and firing energy spheres from their hands. And if this creature opens its head, it will release a homing energy bolt slightly larger than usual, which will disappear only when it lands completely. <gasps> But in addition to the creatures present in the game, there were also some that did not make it into the final version of Half-Life. One of these was the Panther Eye, a cutout of Zen's dog-like creature that moved quickly and tore the player with its sharp claws. Panther Eye's behavior resembles that of a panther, hence the name. There were two versions of it, blue and later red. The red panther can be found in the Half-Life SDK files in a folder called Diablo, but is not in the game files. Moreover, both versions of the creature can be found in the merged Half-Life Alpha. Another enemy cut from the game is Mr. Friendly, who can also be found in the game files. About the size of a horse, Mr. Friendly was a lumbering crawler supported by limbs of varying lengths, with hooves on its hind legs and horn-like spikes on its front. The creature crawled in a shuffling manner and its spines scraped against the floor, creating a sound similar to nails scraping. According to the idea, Mr. Friendly was a non-aggressive scavenger who ate the corpses of dead creatures. This made it possible to logically explain the disappearance of bodies, which is used to improve the speed of the game and not to overload the engine. 
In addition, the creature could warn the player about the presence of enemies nearby. As Gordon approaches Mr. Friendly, the creature could knock the weapon out of his hands and even knock off the character's glasses, thereby putting what was happening on the screen out of focus. However, it was very difficult to implement all this on the first version of the company's engine, so they decided to abandon the idea. There was supposed to be another terrible monster in the Zen Caves, Kingpin. The creature was two times larger than a person, had four eyes and a huge brain for the whole body, and had to move on three legs clanging on the floor. In a later version of the creature called Sactildae nefariosium, it only had one leg left at the end of a thick tail which helped the creature move like a worm, and he could attack with psionic attacks. However, there was no use for the character in the game, and it was cut out. There are also cockroaches in the game that are harmless to the player and have artificial intelligence behavior, but players rarely pay attention to such small details, which is a pity. We'll talk about this a little later. Considering that Half-Life developers from the very beginning were young and ambitious modders with their inherent sense of humor and creative ideas for creating a full-fledged universe around the game, Half-Life players were left with a whole lot of secrets and easter eggs. Valve wanted to make even the weapons in the game special because in addition to the usual pistols, shotguns, and rifles, there is also the iconic crowbar, which is difficult to find in any other popular game series, not counting Diablo 3 or Crossbow. I'm not even mentioning all the super high-tech guns. Black Mesa Turret, HECU Portable Machine Gun, Anti-Personnel and Radio Controlled Mine, Rocket Launcher and Anti-Tank Grenade, Hopwire Grenade, Dynamite, and Tau Cannon. All of these can be used to shoot and cause chaos in Half-Life. It is worth highlighting several unique gadgets. The Tau Cannon, also known as the Gauss Cannon, accumulates damage depending on how long the trigger is held. When the maximum charge is accumulated, the shot will have a repulsive property, an ideal weapon for medium and long ranges. There's another experimental weapon of Black Mesa, Gluon Gun, which shoots a constant spiral vortex of energy beams that can destroy everything they aim at in seconds. I built the Gluon Gun, but I just can't bring myself to use it on another living creature. It doesn't appear that you have any trouble killing things. You can take her with you, but please promise to put her to good use. The ammunition of this weapon is similar to the Tau Cannon. It's depleted Uranium-235, exactly like another Black Mesa prototype, the Displacer Cannon, also known as XV-11382. This weapon has two modes. Either it creates a displacement field that is directed towards the enemy and causes damage to him, or an alternative one. The owner of the gun teleports from Earth to Zen, and vice versa. In the same Zen, there are their own types of weapons, for example, Snark, also known as the Squeak Grenade. In fact, this small creature lives in Zen and is a hand weapon. Outwardly, they look like red beetles with a green eye and are highly aggressive. The player releases snarks from his hands at enemies like living grenades, and they are capable of biting enemies to death. The released snark explores the territory in search of a possible enemy and, when attacking enemies, emits a very loud screech. If the enemy is not found, then the snark can return and attack the player who launched it. Zen's other weapons is the Hive Hand, a device worn on one of his hands that shoots insect-like creatures that seek out and attack a living target. There are only two such weapons to be found in the game. One, in the chapter Surface Tension, is in a room that can be reached by elevator from a hangar filled with mines. The second can be picked up in one of the rooms on level A in the Lambda Complex, right in front of the portal. Oh my god! If I find a camera, you are so doing that again. The aliens also have their own energy cannon, also known as the Alien Turret, a large energy weapon found only once between the mechanized infantry repair hangar and the entrance to the Lambda Complex of Sector F. The alien turret was installed by the alien infantry to guard the entrance to the reactor complex, and unlike most biotech devices, Zen is made of some kind of metal. The cannon fires a powerful blue energy beam. And one of the most creative ideas from the developers for the world of Zen is Violet Crystal, also known as Flower. Unfortunately, the player cannot use it, but it's easy to snatch a little from it. Purple crystals are alien organisms that have a triangular purple body hanging from a stem from the ceiling and lead an attached lifestyle. When a player is nearby, the crystal acts as a turret, firing purple laser beams at the player. However, violet crystal does not pose a great danger since they are easy to destroy or avoid altogether. So enough with the weapons, it's time for the most interesting part, Easter eggs. It's been a long time, brother. 
Maldito huevo. A pretty fun Easter egg called the Gaben Room. You can't just find this Easter egg and you can't get into the so-called room, but if you open the C1A1C map through the console and use the noclip command to fly through the textures, you can find yourself in a room entirely consisting of one single image on which Gabe Newell's face will flaunt. Yes, this is a room made entirely of Gabe Newell. Of course, we should thank not only Gabe Newell or the previously mentioned Mark Laidlaw for how the game turned out, but rather the entire development team. However, it is worth mentioning Greg Coomer, Valve product designer since 1997. Before joining Valve, Greg helped Microsoft develop various software products. Previously, he worked with Nintendo, founded and ran a user interface design company, and worked as a freelance product designer for several years. It was Greg who helped name the company Valve, led the studio's first cancelled project, Prospero, and became one of several prototypes of the appearance when modeling Gordon Freeman's head. Therefore, as a thank you, Half-Life has an easter egg with his mention, locker named after developer Greg Coomer. In Gordon's locker in Sector C, you can find a photo of a child with a thumb up extended in the foreground. The child in the photo is Isabel, daughter of Harry Teasley and Yahtzee Mark. Yahtzee is an artist who worked at Valve from 1996 to 1998, creating textures for Half-Life. Her husband Harry also worked at Valve as an artist and designer, but a little longer, from October 1996 to July 2002, and the image was added as an easter egg. Screenwriter Mark Laidlaw offered the idea that the child is Gordon Freeman's relative, for example, his niece. The locker also contains the 37th Mandala and the Orchid Eater, real-life books written by Mark Laidlaw, plus Gordon's frame diploma, thermos with mug, HEV suit battery, two sticky notes, and blue clothes. After a cascade resonance, the thermos falls to the floor and the diploma falls face down. In this case, the battery for the HEV suit will appear in the locker in the same place where the player already picked it up. By the way, all the names on the lockers in the locker room belong to the developers of the first part of the game. Although there is also a developer whose name appears in the game not only on the locker. This is Dave Ryler. He has also been with Valve since 1997, and before joining the company, he was an active developer in the online Quake community helping id Software with the deployment of Quake World. Dave was a beta tester for Doom 2, Quake, and Warcraft 2, and in his spare time he began learning to code. Then he caught the eye of Valve and was invited as a game designer and level designer. In addition to the name locker in Sector C, the name Ryler is scratched on the wall in the ventilation in Sector E Materials Transport under the HECU outpost on the map C2A2C. He's probably responsible for this level. To notice it, the player needs to illuminate his path with a flashlight. Interesting fact, Nihilinth can be defeated with a crowbar if, when its head opens, you land straight in the middle and strike. It may be wrong to consider this a secret, but it's worth mentioning just in case. And if, upon Gordon's arrival at Black Mesa, you go to the administration table and press the security button under the table, then commotion and panic will suddenly begin around you. But this is, again, rather an interesting secret. Also, in case you didn't know, G-Man only appears nine times per game. At the beginning on the monorail, in the office with the scientist, flashes on the balcony during the battle with the hound eyes, watches the battle with Gargantua, but do you know what interesting secret is connected with this guy? You can look into his gray suitcase if you use the same noclip command. Having flown into the case texture, you can see inside a G-Man ID, a pistol, pencils, and some kind of document. Since the first part of Half-Life release and throughout the entire future series of the game, fans have been building theories about who G-Man is. There is a fairly common fan theory that claims that G-Man is Gordon Freeman from the future. It's not for nothing that his name, although it is short for Government Man and emphasizes that he is a civil servant, consists of the initial and last letters of Gordon's name. If you look at both characters and compare their appearance, you will notice some similarities in hairstyle, eye color, and almost identical cheekbones. The only obvious difference is age, which is why G-Man has more wrinkles and a generally more gaunt face. Gordon Freeman's voice is not heard throughout the entire series of games, and therefore it's not possible to compare it with the voice of G-Man. And this theory is connected with the fact that perhaps G-Man came from the future and, knowing it in advance, guides Gordon along the already traveled path leading to success. In general, all kinds of theories about the Half-Life universe are a topic for a separate, huge video. We listen to the opinions of our subscribers, so if you are interested in this topic, show it with your comments and likes, 
and we will make such a video. Another interesting game aspect is the closed door in the training level. The idea is that the player needs to ask the guard to open the door for him, but if you go to the door and try to open it yourself, then of course you won't be able to do it, and you can hear access denied over the loudspeaker. Here, the developers left a little funny secret for the player. Continue to try to open the door on your own, and over time the announcer will prohibit entry with all sorts of roundabout wording. Entry is not an option. Will we do this all day? Move on immediately. By the way, you may have noticed that in the first part of Half-Life and its additions, the model of Gordon Freeman in a HEV suit has a small ponytail on his head, and Gordon's model in a lab coat doesn't have a ponytail. The fact is that the developers made a mistake by simply forgetting to remove the character's ponytail in the release version of the game. According to canon, Gordon has no ponytail. It's interesting that at the development stage of the game, Gordon Freeman had a completely different model, and today the game could look different. The thick red beard made the character look like a stereotypical biker, and instead of the familiar protective suit, he was wearing a space suit with the word research on the back. Yvonne the Space Biker was the name given to Gordon Freeman's cutout model from the game. As you probably noticed from Easter eggs, we smoothly move on to the game design and its gameplay features. It's time to talk about the feel of the game and why it became so legendary. The game plot develops using pre-written scripts that function directly within the gameplay. Thus, the gameplay and the plot presentation with this approach form a single whole. And this is many years before the God of War reboot with its one camera shooting. Pite me, Kratos. At one time, although the game was assembled piece by piece from separate parts of the world, it was not divided into levels or missions. The game World Division by loading is caused solely by technical limitations. Well, the player, as you already know, observes all the events in Half-Life through the eyes of the main character, Gordon Freeman. The entire plot of the game is divided into chapters between which the developers have built in level loading. This allowed them to tie the narrative together quite organically. But since the ride takes five minutes, the first chapter quickly ends and the gameplay begins in the second. At the same time, for the first five minutes, the player does absolutely nothing, does not interact with the environment in any way. Through his window, he simply observes how Black Mesa works, what the employees do, independently moving robots, some equipment, and the G-Man. The thing is that this entire level is assembled from individual developments and demo processes while testing the engine capabilities. It was these demos that were shown at E3 1997, where they captured the attention of those present so much that everyone began to patiently wait for the full game. And so, when the game was ready, the developers thought, why not insert all this at the beginning of the game? as a way to introduce the player to the background so that they can see through the eyes of the main character the prerequisites for future events. Today, many players would quit such a game without even starting to really play. Obviously, to release Half-Life with such a long intro, you had to have especially hard balls, or be Gabe Newell, which is essentially the same thing. But in 1998, this approach worked and everyone happily rode the monorail for five minutes with their mouths open, turning their heads and watching what was happening around them. Then your own may depend on your fitness. Do you have a friend or relative who would make a valuable addition to the Black Mesa team? And the first thing the player noticed in the game while playing was the atmosphere. Starting from this monorail ride and up to Cascade Resonance, as well as the events that followed, the player was in a state of surprise, slight trepidation, and anticipation of what would happen next. In terms of graphics, in 1998, Half-Life was also the leading action shooter game released that year. For example, in the tactical shooter Delta Force, the graphics were close to the brainchild of Valve, but still in Half-Life, the graphics were prettier. Unless Unreal released in the same year on its own engine of the same name, Unreal Engine 1. Yes, the same engine, version 5 of which today produces cinematic graphics, could compete with the Valve game. At the same time, Half-Life hooked the player with both a thoughtful and sometimes mysterious world and a well-developed shooting system. And for a first-person shooter, this was, if not the basis, then a great advantage. 
Even today, the weapons in the game feel quite realistic. Recoil, shooting accuracy, reloading bullet tracers, and even shell casings flying out of the barrel. In the absence of cutscenes, the player gets 100% of the gameplay, starting from the starting bridge near Sector C, ending with the final goal of destroying Nylanth. But at the same time, the game does not turn into a stupid hit and run, but poses various puzzles for the player, forcing them to think. The player is often faced with the choice of killing opponents or running further, climbing into the ventilation or diving into the water, or where to turn when driving a cart in a tunnel. All this creates an adventure for the player and allows greater immersion. Hello, hello, immersive sim, we recognize you. And simply shooting opponents is not at all boring due to well-constructed levels. Well, you could already see for yourself the mystery and mysticism of the plot. Only G-Man, flickering slightly during the game, envelops the whole story in a veil of mystery. Now you understand why the mystical atmosphere was inspired by the series The Outer Limits, The X-Files, and Stephen King's story The Mist. When machines fail, when technology fails, when the conventional religion fails, people have got to have something. Even a zombie lurching through the night can seem pretty cheerful compared to the existential comedy slash horror of the ozone layer dissolving under the combined assault of a million fluorocarbon spray cans of deodorant. Of course, sound also affects the player's world perception, starting with the voice of the announcer which accompanies the protagonist's ride on the monorail at the very beginning of the game, ending with the ambient music pressing on the player. And how creepy this is. The developers did everything to make the player feel like a savage, even on Earth, in an unfamiliar and frightening world. Responsible for all of the game's audio is composer, musician, game designer, and conceptual artist Kelly Bailey, who is a senior game sound and music designer at Valve and created all the sound effects in the Half-Life series. Special thanks to him for it. You will recognize the sounds of Half-Life even without seeing the images. Oh dear! Ah! Oh! 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 Oh my! My goodness! And all of these sounds and music will definitely bring back memories from those days when you first heard them during the first game launch. And we'll talk separately about the music that played a key role in the iconic Valve screensaver when we get to the second part of Half-Life. It was also Kelly Bailey and level designer John Guthrie who came up with the test chamber disaster scene featured at the beginning of Half-Life. This took them one weekend, during which they worked 48 hours straight. Arriving at the office on Monday, still in a zombie state, Guthrie and Bailey were pleased to see that the rest of the team enjoyed the episode after finishing it. So let's get back to the music. During its writing, Bailey used licensed or standard samples in some compositions. A prime example is Sony's Methods of Mayhem Industrial Toolkit Sample Pack, which was used by the composer for much of the game's soundtrack. And since the sample pack was publicly available at the time, some of the same samples can often be heard in other games or even films. For example, the drum beat sample used in Hard Technology Rock can also be heard in the Crush's Command & Conquer Red Alert soundtrack. The mechanics in the game are quite simple, but for a 1998 game, they are at a decent level. There are standard door openings by the player, but there are also mechanics with artificial intelligence, which assumes that the door should be opened by a guard or scientist standing nearby. Quite a few doors do not need to be opened according to the plot, but if you bring a guard to them, you can accidentally find yourself in a secret room with cartridges, batteries for a suit, or first aid kits. By the way, remember we talked about cockroaches in the game? Few people know about the roach AI mechanics present in the game, which, as you might guess, is responsible for the artificial intelligence of cockroaches. They actively search for food by smell, so if a piece of meat falls in the room, a bunch of cockroaches will run towards it. And if a person appears in the room, they run away in fear in different directions. And just like in life, cockroaches are afraid of light. That's how much the developers thought of a detail that doesn't affect the gameplay in any way. Moreover, there is another mechanic in the game. 
AI sense of smell, which is responsible for the creature's reaction to the smell of corpses and scraps of destroyed aliens. NPCs notice an unpleasant odor, which also attracts bull squid, forcing him to go in search of food. At the same time, bull squid will not eat the second corpse since he's already eaten the first one and is no longer hungry. And 30 seconds later, after the death of a creature, the corpse smell disappears and no NPC reaction is observed. Oh, what's that stench? Half-Life gameplay always encourages the player to take action. If you can't open a door, go around this place through the ventilation shaft. If you can't get into the ventilation shaft, move the boxes and climb up them. The developers will perfect this theme with puzzles in Half-Life 2, and therefore the fans who worked on the remake of the first part of Black Mesa added many interesting mechanics to their project. There even appeared doors that open only after connecting the cable from them to electricity. Well, you understand. The game also had a mechanic for restoring health through wall terminals, and similar terminals for restoring the charge of the HEV suit developed by Black Mesa, probably ideologically stolen from Aperture Science. They were installed everywhere throughout the complex. The player just had to approach it and hold down the use button, and health, or the suit, would be smoothly restored. Considering that the suit is essentially served as additional armor for the player, this was very useful. In the future, this game feature will migrate to the next games in the Half-Life series. Separately, it is worth mentioning the Network mod, which appeared in the game with the release of mods. Half-Life has a Deathmatch mod, both casual and team, that supports up to 32 players. Players were given the opportunity to change the model of the character they would play and the colors of his clothing. You could also choose an image for your graffiti, which the player could use to mark places he had already been to. The drawing for graffiti was either selected from the list of built-in ones, or the player could import his own from the computer. Some types of weapons in multiplayer received different behavior. For example, the Tau Cannon had increased recoil, the crossbow fired explosive bolts, and the revolver now had a laser designator that worked as an optical sight. Half-Life used the World Opponent Network w -O -N, an online gaming service created by Sierra as servers for the game. However, on July 31st, 2004, it was closed and Valve, without any hesitation, replaced it with its gaming platform, Steam, through which it was possible to play online. Soon, the multiplayer option of Half-Life was included as a mode in the retail version of Counter-Strike. The multiplayer was later ported to the Source engine and released as a separate game called Half-Life Deathmatch Source. Few people remember it today, especially considering how far Valve's multiplayer games have come. We'll talk about this a little later. Having completed Half-Life in its entirety, the player is given two endings to choose from, although the canonical one is only one of them, which is plot connected with the continuation Valve was already planning at that time. Yes, we know how the game ends canonically, but what will happen if Gordon still refuses to work for the G-Man? In 2007, the developers answered this question by releasing a modification to the first part of the game called Instinct. It reveals an alternate ending where Gordon refuses the G-Man's offer and ends up no, not in Zen. For some reason, the scientist finds himself in the very depths of the Black Mesa complex and is forced to make his way up through crowds of aliens. Otherwise, in 12 hours, the complex will collapse and all its employees will die. As extra fun for Gordon Freeman, why not? And yet it is worth understanding that the canonical choice is the decision to enter the portal offered by G-Man. What happened next? Then the game was released. And what did you think happened? It was not just another game release, it was the full-fledged birth of the Valve Company's firstborn, and everyone immediately fell in love with it. The game was a success. The game was released on November 19, 1998, and although a year before that at the E3 presentation everyone was already amazed by the upcoming project, now it has finally conquered the critics. The remastered version of Half-Life was presented at E3 1998 and immediately won the Game Critics Awards for Best PC Game and Best Action Game. And as a promotional campaign, Valve Studio presented two more new demos, Half-Life Day One, containing the first fifth of the game, and Half-Life Uplink that featured original content. Half-Life was named Game of the Year by 50 different publications, sold 8 million copies worldwide, and earned the company $22 million in profit in its first year alone. The total profit from game sales amounted to over $100 million. And in addition to the British marketing agency Cruise Control, they made a short film based on Half-Life with the same name, Half-Life Uplink. It was presented on February 11, 1999, and told the story of a journalist who infiltrates the Black Mesa Research Center, trying to find out what happened there. Okay, 
Warning, malfunction, dimensional defense, control. This is Jazz Meadows doing a special report. The Black Mesa Research Center. Oh a few days ago. Let's kill him now! But as usual, projects that suddenly become successful often fall out of favor with someone and run into some kind of criticism. Thus, in Germany, in accordance with the requirements of the Federal Department for Media Harmful to Youth, BPJM in German, which regulates images of violence against people, the game was improved. Because of this, Half-Life was censored in Germany. Valve replaced human characters in the game with robots, blood with oil, and body parts with gears. It wasn't until almost 20 years later in 2017 that BPJM apparently admitted their mistake and removed Half-Life from their blacklist. Or perhaps the department's decision was influenced by the game's age. Like, no one will play it anyway. So, to celebrate this, Valve released Half-Life Uncensored in Germany, a free downloadable content pack that removed censorship. Otherwise, there was no negativity towards the game either at the time of release or at the beginning of the 2000s. The score on Metacritic was 96 out of 100. Other popular publications also rated the game 9.5 out of 10. And, satisfied with the results, the developers began preparing ports for other platforms. And since the Valve Studio planned to work on new games, Captivation Digital Laboratories and Gearbox Software provided assistance in porting. They developed a port of Half-Life for the Dreamcast with new character models and textures, as well as the exclusive Blue Shift expansion. In fact, the Gearbox company started as Valve's assistants and created the large and no less legendary Borderlands and Duke Nukem Forever. But that's another story. If you're interested in hearing about it, you know what to do. In March 2001, Sega decided to discontinue the Dreamcast console and cancelled several games being developed for it. Then, publisher Sierra cancelled the Half-Life port a few weeks before its scheduled release in June. Gearbox changed plans and released the Blue Shift add-on for Windows, and the Half-Life port for the Dreamcast became the basis for creating a game port on the PlayStation 2. It was not cancelled, and in 2001, Half-Life was released on the PlayStation 2, along with a new exclusive edition, Half-Life Decay. We'll talk about these additions a little later. There was still an idea for some time to make a port of Half-Life for Mac, but in 2000, Valve cancelled this game version because, according to Gabe Newell, the port was substandard and would have made Mac players second-class customers. But Rebecca Heinemann, the co-founder of Logicware, who worked on the port, said that Valve cancelled the port because Apple angered them by distorting sales forecasts. Well, that's what Gabe is all about. Maybe that's why we love him and hate him at the same time. As a result, Valve released Half-Life ports for Mac OS and Linux only in 2013. After the release of Half-Life, Gabe and his team began working on the sequel to the first part. And by the words, that's all Gabe, they meant the stubborn desire of the developer to do everything the way he likes, or not to do it at all. Somewhere in the universe, Half-Life 3 is crying. In the future, he'll prove more than once that he is capable of canceling a project when it's almost finished, because he always wants to make candy. He wants to surprise others. Innovation, do you remember? And there's something special in this Gabe's approach, mysterious to others, but inspiring. After all, you never know what is in his head and what his next step is. He's so passionate about ideas that he wants to bring them to perfection, and if it doesn't work out, then silently cancel them. This is why the first Half-Life was redesigned almost from scratch after the team did not like the result of the work done. This is why the best of the best were initially selected for the Valve team, and that's why the company's first game turned out to be such a masterpiece. Well, before developing the sequel, Gabe set only one goal for the team. There was a meeting early on with the Half-Life 2 team where I said, you don't have to worry about how long it's going to take, you don't have to worry about how much money you're going to spend, the only thing you have to worry about is making it the best game of all time. We'll talk about how Half-Life 2 was created, how it turned out, and what happened in the next video, but now let's see how the previously mentioned additions to the original game turned out. And believe me, we've not yet told all the interesting details. Half-Life has received enthusiastic support from independent game developers, largely thanks to the support and encouragement from Valve itself. The level design tool used during the development of the Worldcraft game was included in the game's software. The game's accompanying materials even talked about the possible release of Worldcraft as a retail product, but these plans never came to fruition. Valve released a software development kit that allowed developers to modify the game and create mods, and over time, they were born. Half-Life add-ons. Half-Life Add-on Pack is a small add-on pack for the Half-Life game, containing additional games in the series. It included not only games from Valve Corporation, but also some individual add-ons which in the future became full-fledged games. These include Blue Shift, Opposing Force, 
Team Fortress Classic, Counter-Strike, Deathmatch Classic, and Half-Life Decay. And since the plot of some editions expands the main story of Half-Life, it would be wrong not to talk about them. Gearbox Software created the Opposing Force add-on in November 1999. Gearbox Software lead designer Randy Pitchford noted that, in his opinion, the studio was chosen for development because Valve wanted to move away a little from Half-Life and concentrate on their future projects. During development, Gearbox brought in a lot of talent from other areas of the video game industry to improve certain design aspects, and the addition itself was supposed to show the events of Half-Life from the point of view of a U.S. Marine, one of the hostile characters of the original. Half-Life Opposing Force begins simultaneously with the events of the original Half-Life and continues the day after Cascade Resonance. Copy that, HQ. And where the hell are we anyway? Well, the pilot thought we were heading to your mother's house. <laughs> so far, this all looks familiar. Yeah, this real cute, Jack. A very young and inexperienced 22-year-old Corporal Adrian Shepard is flying on board one of the V-22 Osprey landing tiltraters. He and his squad did not yet know what the target of their mission is and what to do at the facility. He was informed that they would receive instructions about the task directly at the location. However, there's an air battle that starts unexpectedly as one of the extraterrestrial life forms attacks the tiltrater with Shepard on it, which is why it crashes. The main character, Corporal Adrian Shepard, loses consciousness during the crash of a V-22 Osprey and only comes to his senses several hours later in the hospital. This happens just as HECU troops begin evacuating Black Mesa. Despite the fact that the Corporal makes it to one of the last helicopters, G-Man's intervention does not allow him to leave the complex. G-Man cuts off his path to the evacuation helicopter, locking Adrian in one of the tunnels. Shepard, against his will, has to move deeper into the complex where he meets other HECU soldiers who also failed to evacuate. The doomed Shepard and his men are forced to fight not only the usual aliens from Zen, but also the newly arrived Race X and a group of black ops. Scientists came across Race X accidentally during their experiments and studied its inhabitants in Sector E of Black Mesa. And as a result of the Cascade Resonance, regardless of the Xena aliens, this race began to teleport to Black Mesa. After the complex destruction, the only way to Earth for Race X was closed, which is why it did not appear in subsequent games of the Half-Life series. Black Ops are much more common in Half-Life Opposing Force than in Half-Life and play a larger role. The reason for their appearance in Black Mesa has long been known. They arrived at the complex to finish the job started by the HECU soldiers. Black Ops treat HECU soldiers with contempt, believing that they cannot do anything on their own and always have to be cleaned up after. Among the complex workers, there were only rumors about the existence of such a unit as Black Ops Ninjas, which was covering their tracks. However, both Gordon and Adrian Shepard really have to face them. They kill all the remaining soldiers who did not have time to evacuate along with everyone else. At the same time, the HECU soldiers know nothing about the arrival of Black Ops, and when they meet them, they are surprised, thinking that they are here to help. Just like the scientists and other surviving employees of Black Mesa believed that the military had arrived to save them, at the same time, HECU soldiers simply hate Gordon Freeman and consider him their number one target. Supposedly, he is persona non grata, who has ruined their life. This can be understood by the graffiti found in the game, which literally read, Surrender Freeman, and you die. To quickly cover up the incident and indeed destroy the entire complex, Black Ops ninjas took a thermonuclear bomb with them. Adrian Shepard finds this explosive device and disables it, but it is later reactivated by the G-Man. The flash of a nuclear explosion can be seen at the end. In this add-on, the player can watch Gordon Freeman jumping into a teleporter into the Zen world. However, despite the fact that the plot of the original and the expansion are parallel, it ends after the Half-Life story. The plot of the add-on ends with the G-Man detaining Shepard so that he cannot tell anyone of what he saw. Opposing Force has its own Easter eggs, although much less than in the original Half-Life. For example, the developers decided to immortalize themselves in this game so you can find their names using the same principle as in Half-Life. They are left on the bedside drawers of the military in the barracks. And if you turn on the noclip and use it to go down under the barracks, you can find an empty room with the inscription DMM1999 on the floor. These are the initials of Gearbox Software game designer David Mertz, who worked on this level in Opposing Force and also had a hand in the development of Half-Life Blue Shift. But outside of Opposing Force, in the game files, the developers left an even more interesting easter egg. Just find the audio file DS Boss It, which lasts only 4 seconds and does not sound in the game itself. When you play it back, you can hear something indistinct, some kind of cacophony of sounds, 
But if you play it backwards, you'll hear... To win the game, you must kill me, Randy Pitchford. At the same time, Randy Pitchford is the co-founder of Gearbox Software and currently the CEO and president of the Gearbox Entertainment Company. This is a reference to John Romero and his message to the players in Doom 2. In June 2001, Gearbox released its second expansion, Half-Life Blue Shift. The game again showed the events that happened in Half-Life, but now from the point of view of a different character, the Black Mesa Guard and Gordon's good friend, Barney Calhoun. It was in this add-on that the player could find out that the guard banging on the door when the main character of Half-Life was riding the monorail to work at the beginning of Half-Life was Barney Calhoun. It is worth understanding that at that time, it was impossible to distinguish many key characters by appearance. Everyone we could see in the future in the second part of Half-Life and its additions was in one way or another in the first part of the game. Eli Vance and Dr. Kleiner survived the Cascade Resonance, and it is Eli who opened the door from the laboratory for Gordon. But during the first playthrough back in 1998, few could understand this. The same with Barney, who looked like absolutely any guard in the first part. So if it weren't for the Blue Shift add-on, we might still not know that at the beginning of the game, it wasn't Barney who opened the door for Gordon. Half-Life Blue Shift was developed as a bonus chapter for the Sega Dreamcast port of Half-Life. The release of Half-Life port along with Blue Shift was originally scheduled for November 1st, 2000. However, to make sure that a large number of people were expecting the port, the publishing company Sierra Entertainment postponed its release until the end of the year. And at that time, fan interest was only fueled with information about the gameplay and plot. The game was released only the following year, and Sierra officially announced the cancellation of the Half-Life port on the Dreamcast, explaining this decision as, quote, changes in the market situation. Naturally, the Dreamcast port of Blue Shift was also cancelled, and instead, the developer moved the project to PC. However, it did not make it a bonus part of Half-Life, but released the game as an independent one, which did not even require the player to copy the original Half-Life. Good morning, and welcome to the Black Mesa Transit System. This automated train is provided for the comfort and convenience of Black Mesa residents and visitors to the Black Mesa Research Facility. Barney is an ordinary security officer working at the Black Mesa Research Complex, responsible for the safety of personnel and the equipment in the underground sector of the complex. He rides the monorail to work at 8.42 a.m. from Zone 8 to the Security Center. Along the way, he listens to information about the Black Mesa and can be inspired by the scale of the whole complex, including both above ground and underground levels. In fact, it feels like the developers have some kind of unhealthy love for monorails and trains. Getting off at his stop, Barney sees Gordon Freeman passing by on the next train, heading to Sector C. There appears to be a problem. Barney cannot get into the security center. The guard inside helps open the door, and Barney goes to get a weapon and a bulletproof vest. Along the way, he sees on surveillance cameras how Gordon heads to the test chamber, and Gina Cross delivers a crystal sample for research. He's informed that scientists are having problems with the elevator, and he's forced to go ahead and help them. On the way to Sector G, Barney notices that something strange is happening. Scientists are trying to fix one of the supercomputers. Stopping at one of the railroad crossings, he sees G-Man passing by on the train. Eventually, Barney makes it to the elevator and fixes it. Suddenly, during the elevator descent, a cascade resonance occurs. He does not have time to understand what is happening. The elevator falls down, and Barney loses consciousness from the impact. When Barney comes to his senses, he sees several alien creatures eating the guard's corpse. Both scientists in the elevator are dead, and the character must move alone through the industrial area of Black Mesa, hoping to find help. Barney realizes that government troops are trying to cover up the incident, preventing the complex's personnel from evacuation. Advancing through Black Mesa, Calhoun eventually finds Dr. Rosenberg, who says that the only way to escape without being killed by the soldiers is to use the old teleporter in the abandoned part of the Lambda complex if it is still working. Barney and Rosenberg reach the old part of the research complex, the prototype laboratories, where scientists have reassembled the abandoned teleporter. In order for the teleport to fully function, Barney has to go to Zen and activate the teleportation control device. After the character returns from Zen, the group faces another problem. 
The energy in the battery is only enough to move Barney to Zen and back. Now he needs to go down to the level of power installations, find a new battery, and charge it using a generator. However, special forces also arrive there and now Barney has to fight not only the aliens, but also soldiers at the same time, before starting the generators and charging the battery. As the time to escape approaches, Barney helps operate the simple parts of the teleporter so that all the scientists can escape the complex. When he is the last one left, special forces burst into the room, but the character manages to jump into the teleporter. He moves to the rest of the scientists at the exit from the southern tunnel where they are preparing to leave. When Barney appears, Rosenberg runs up to him to thank him, but notices that something is happening to him. Within seconds, Barney is transported first to Zen's platforms and then to the Black Mesa warehouse where two soldiers are dragging an unconscious Gordon Freeman into a trash compactor. After this, Barney returns to the scientists. During this time, they manage to open the gate and start the car, and when the characters leave Black Mesa, the game ends. Blue Shift is the shortest add-on in the Half-Life series. Well, with the exception of Episode 1, which will be released much later. However, here the developers also have hidden a couple of easter eggs for fans. The developers' names in the staff locker room no longer surprise us, but right there in Barney's locker, the player can see several interesting details. Firstly, photographs on the floor depict the character's girlfriend, Lauren, and a friend or relative named Joe. In fact, they depict relatives of Gearbox employees who probably are named the same in real life. Secondly, you can see a cardboard box here. It's not easy to crash it. You'll have to shoot 68 times with a pistol. However, inside is a Chum Toad, a Xenian that was originally created for the original Half-Life, but was cut from the game and only appeared as an Easter egg in the Half-Life Opposing Force and Blue Shift expansions. Unlike most of Zen's creatures, Chum Toads are not dangerous to humans. They are slightly larger in size than a Snark and similar to a terrestrial frog. The creature is notable for its brilliant purple coloring, spines on its back and blue tongue, which the chum toad constantly sticks out and retracts like a snake. And in the center, there is one red eye, reminiscent of a cat's. Chum toads move in quick hops and sometimes make croaking sounds like terrestrial frogs. Another game released in the spring of 1999 was Team Fortress Classic, a first-person shooter developed by Valve and published by Sierra Studios. The game was originally based on the 1996 Quake mod of the same name, and over time, Valve hired the developers of the Team Fortress mod to create Team Fortress Classic in their Gold Source engine, which was used in Half-Life. This is how the studio wanted to promote the previously mentioned software development kit, SDK, Half-Life. As a result, the world saw a project that today is known for its more modern second part. The game features two teams who fight each other in online multiplayer matches. Each participant plays as one of nine classes with different skills. Each character class has a set of weapons and abilities unique to that particular class. This difference creates rock-paper-scissors gameplay and motivates team members to work together to achieve a goal. Thus, the class system, in combination with one another, helps players gain an advantage over the enemy. Interestingly, every class in the game has a melee weapon, and as a tribute to Half-Life, the developers gave all classes, with the exception of Medic, Spy, and Engineer, a crowbar. All classes are cool and interesting, but if you want to know more about them, write in the comments under the video. We'll talk about the creation of Team Fortress, Counter-Strike, how Valve influenced the development of the tactical shooter genre, the esports field, and much more. Write a comment, and we'll move on. What can we say about Counter-Strike, also known as Half-Life Counter-Strike, or Counter-Strike 1.6, developed by talented modders Min Guzman Lee and Jess Kleif, later hired by Valve, and released by Sierra in 2000. Every high school student was familiar with this tactical shooter. Moreover, both at the beginning of the 2000s and to this day, Counter-Strike has grown into a full-fledged series which was recently replenished with another iteration, Counter-Strike 2. And those who were children in the 2000s today gladly continue playing this game. And all this despite the fact that the game is an ordinary tactical shooter for multiplayer and actually has no plot. Players take on the role of counter-terrorist forces or terrorists opposing them, and simply spend several rounds on various game maps. To do this, the players provided with a large arsenal of weapons, from pistols to grenades, machine guns, and sniper rifles. In each round, two teams are tasked with defeating each other, either by achieving map objectives or by eliminating all enemy fighters. 
Depending on the map, the teams may have only two goals. The terrorists either mine the enemy base or guard the hostages, and the brave special forces must either free the hostages or defuse the terrorists' bomb. Based on this, the game has a well-structured economy which creates even greater intrigue from round to round. And for more than 23 years, this game has been improving, developing the esports direction and attracting attention to the screens of millions of people around the world. I think we will definitely talk about it another time. Nico, how poetic, and it's simple and bit, and simple sitting down! No! No! Disaster! Disaster! An absolute disaster! Well, another multiplayer game was the Deathmatch Classic modification developed and published by Valve themselves. Deathmatch Classic was originally created by Valve as a tribute to id Software and, in fact, a remake of the multiplayer component of the Quake game. They made it in three months and released it as an update to the main game, but a little later they made the full release of the independent game on June 1st, 2001. The game included five maps remade from Quake, and the gameplay was similar to Quake Deathmatch with almost the same weapons, with the exception of the melee weapon, which of course was the signature crowbar from the Half-Life series. Deathmatch Classic even imitated the Quake physics, which allowed an advanced player to gain a lot of extra speed or jump very high. This move was popularly called the Bunny Hop due to its similarity to rabbits hopping. And from here, the Bunny Hop migrated to other Valve shooters. The game did not gain wide popularity, like the team-oriented mods Team Fortress and Counter-Strike, but Deathmatch Classic still found its fans among nostalgic veterans of the Deathmatch mod and Quake fans. Finally, the last add-on we'll mention is Half-Life Decay, an add-on developed by Gearbox Software that was released in November 2001. But what's interesting is that this add-on was released exclusively on PlayStation 2. And although a PC version was being developed, Gearbox cancelled it at one time, and many players saw this edition only in September 2008 when Half-Life Decay was successfully ported to PC by a group of fans from Ukraine. Like previous Gearbox expansions Opposing Force and Blue Shift, Decay returns the player to the origins of the original story, but with different characters. This time, the main characters of the game were Gordon Freeman's female colleagues, Gina Cross and Colette Green. If Dr. Cross is already familiar to the player, since she is a model for a hologram during training in Half-Life, and she could also be seen in Blue Shift, then Dr. Green is a new character in Decay. The best part is that Decay is a co-op multiplayer game that two people can play at the same time, and they can play together. Of course, you can go through the game alone, but it's not as fun and interesting. Ah, excellent. Everything appears to be on schedule, and the experiment will be starting shortly. I will leave the loudspeaker on so you can hear what's happening upstairs. In the story, Gina Cross and Colette Green, under the guidance of Doctors Keller and Rosenberg, deliver a sample of the Zen Crystal and prepare an anti-mass spectrometer for Gordon Freeman. Then, as we know, a cascade resonance occurs and the characters return to Keller and Rosenberg, already encountering the hostile Zen fauna on their way. Keller believes it is necessary to close the spatial rift, and Rosenberg believes that it is necessary to get to the surface and call for help. Gina and Colette accompany Dr. Rosenberg on his way to the train station, the shortest route to the surface. Having reached the Satellite Communications Center, Dr. Rosenberg remains to wait for the military, and we will find out his fate in the Blue Shift add-on, and the female characters return to Dr. Keller. The doctor sends Gina and Colette to activate the suppression gates to restart the suppression field, which will help avoid cascade resonance again. At this point, the military arrives and attempts to eliminate all personnel and alien forces. After rebooting key equipment to prevent another breakdown, scientists are tasked with preparing the satellite for launch. The satellite that Freeman launches in Half-Life is used in tandem with ground equipment to significantly reduce the effects of Cascade Resonance. Dr. Keller instructs Cross and Green to activate this prototype equipment, a displacement beacon which can seal an interdimensional rift via satellite. Using the displacement beacon, the three Zen crystals are charged. To prevent their focusing and subsequent closing of the spatial rift, Zen's troops begin to teleport to the site near the beacon. However, upon activating the beacon, both characters are caught in harmonic reflux, a distortion caused by the rift. Despite this, they manage to return safely to Dr. Keller, who congratulates the characters on their successful task completion. After this, the Vortigaunts sent by Nihilanth return a sample of the crystal located in Black Mesa for experiments to Zen. They find it in an underground parking lot seized by the military, and by all accounts, the Albanian Mafia rules deal with the Black operatives and return the crystal to Zen.
So, we have looked at all the main additions to the first part of Half-Life, but these are not all existing mods and add-ons for the game, which are regularly developed by its fans. After all, 25 years have passed since the first Half-Life release, and during this time the game has become quite noticeably outdated. Actually, for this reason, skilled fans gathered and quickly created a fan remake of the original Half-Life on the Source engine called Black Mesa in just 16 years. Ah, my goodness. The Black Mesa project was originally announced in 2004 and was developed by Crowbar Collective for many years. The team was unhappy with Half-Life Source, Valve's own port of Half-Life, to the studio's new engine, Source, without any improvements in graphics or gameplay. Valve re-released the original Half-Life with support for the Havoc physics engine, improved water and lighting effects, however the level design, textures, and models remained unchanged, and the changes that were added barely modified the game. It still felt like a game from six years ago, especially compared to Half-Life 2. Therefore, a team of fan modders set to work on their own remake. As a result, after years of working together, two independent development teams came together to form Crowbar Collective. Only later did they become a studio and fall under Valve's wing. They tried to recreate Half-Life, taking full advantage of the advanced capabilities of the Source engine with improved physics, models, and lighting. Fans wanted to rework all textures, models, levels, and create realistic gameplay. But these goals kept changing as new versions of Source were released and technology improved. Deadlines kept getting pushed back, thus the game remained in the status of vaporware for many years. When everyone seems to know about its development, but at the same time it still isn't coming out, although it hasn't been cancelled. As a result, Crowbar Collective reworked the level design of a number of levels, puzzles, and even the artificial intelligence of opponents, and the most significant changes were made to the last levels of the game, which take place in the world of Zen. It was enlarged and visually brought to an ideal that the Valve Studio physically couldn't achieve in 1998. The release date was postponed several times, but on September 1st, 2012, the release timer went live on the official website. Finally, on September 14th, 2012, the remake was released as a free user modification of the original Half-Life. Only, it turned out to be incomplete, since the previously mentioned Zen was not in the game, the final chapters of the game were missing. The fact is that the last chapters which take place in the alien world of Zen the team intended to rework completely since Zen in the original Half-Life was often considered its weakest part. This is not surprising because creating a full-fledged space world in 1998 was difficult enough and Zen in Half-Life turned out to be small and empty. Then on November 1st, a new announcement took place. The release of Zen was planned for November 2017. By 2013, a new version of the Source engine was introduced, however, developers had to pay to access the engine's full feature set. According to project manager Adam Engels, upon completion of Black Mesa around the same year, Valve approached their team and offered to make Black Mesa a commercial release and thus obtain a license for the Source engine. The team considered this option. Full access to the Source engine allowed them to make Black Mesa the best game they could. They agreed, although they initially did not intend to make profit from the game. Thus, Crowbar Collective secured the approval of the copyright holder company, Valve, and by November 2013, the team received Valve's permission to sell the game. In 2015, Black Mesa was released in early access as a standalone commercial game through Valve's Steam service. At the same time, Valve not only gave the go-ahead for the game release, it patronized the developers and some team members were invited to Valve's office in Bellevue, Washington. Zen was still being developed and its release continued to be postponed, first to the fall of 2018 and then to an unknown date. At the same time, critics were already pleased with the quality of the game's rework, its improved gameplay, and the developers' attention to detail in recreating the atmosphere of the original. Finally, on November 19, 2018, the Zen trailer for Black Mesa was shown to fans and its first beta version was released in the summer of 2019. Soon, the full release of the last five chapters with Zen took place, and by March 2020, the game was completely finished. And 16 years later, development was completed. Black Mesa left early access.
In the release version of the game, the design of the earthly levels was slightly updated to match the quality of Zen's locations, and the artificial intelligence of the HECU soldiers and Vortigaunts was also reworked. In addition, the developers added new animation for zombies, improved the RPG guidance system, and did a tremendous job with the level design. We tried to think about short-term and long-term goals, because a map is only fun and directed if you know what your long-term goal is and what your short-term goal is. So that kind of tied back into what I was saying, where we tried to make sure that when you enter a room, the player sees the exit, because that's, that's an immediate establishment of your long-term goal. And that was something that I think we did most effectively in the first Zen map, for example. You come out of that space, the interloper tower is right there in front of you. You know you're going there at some point. And then you also have the big island that you go to at the end of the map next to that. So you kind of get a sense that's where I'm heading. And then you kind of snake off the path to the left and you just get your short term goals as you progress. One of the developer's level design principles was the idea that when introducing a new mechanic, the level should teach the new mechanic without potential harm to the player character, and then test those mechanics in a more dangerous situation for the character. The team also included a brief mention of the long drop boots from Aperture Science from the Portal series. Yes, Portal came out much later, after Half-Life 2, but was loosely connected narratively to the Half-Life universe and the team considered it appropriate to show the technology of a competing laboratory on the territory of Black Mesa precisely in this regard. In general, a lot of changes have been made, and Black Mesa is very different from both the original game and the remake released by Valve Studio. We won't list all the changes, but for example, two new types of crystals have appeared in Zen. Blue is an analog of the healing pond of Zen, only restores the charge of the suit instead of health, and green replenishes the supply of uranium-235 in unlimited quantities, thanks to which you can endlessly use Tau Cannon or a Gluon Cannon. In addition to reworking Zen from the ground up as the team members got closer to release, they realized that they were looking at the game more as an opportunity for new players to get into the Half-Life series. Therefore, they began to work on introducing designs and functions that would be more suitable for the game a decade after the Half-Life release. They made combat more interesting by improving enemy AI and creating new combat zones with more cover and options for the player. And what effect does music specially written for some battle scenes have on the player? Just listen. And since Zen has been expanded, the developers also wanted to make sure players didn't get stuck early in the game and made changes to some of these levels. It's not even worth mentioning how the graphics have changed. Today, it is second only to Half-Life Alex, and this is not particularly noticeable. All models, textures, and levels were created from scratch, and it took a lot of time and effort. Dozens of people worked on the project. There's about a hundred of them in the credits, and it's likely that many of them have already started their own careers in game development over the course of 16 years. Therefore, Black Mesa once again proves how Half-Life is a cult game that has become a real work of art. In fact, to sum it up, there seems to be no better way to get acquainted with the Half-Life universe in the original game than through the lovingly created remake of Black Mesa by fans, especially when the original game is already in its third decade and some interesting ideas remained poorly developed even in the remake by the developers themselves. So, if you haven't played Half-Life 1 yet and were afraid to do so because of the game's age, but want to get acquainted with this legendary series, try starting with Black Mesa. Well, it seems that we have touched on all the details of this large-scale iceberg. However, this is just the beginning, and a deep immersion into the world of Half-Life universe awaits us. In the next video, we'll see about what the events in Black Mesa led to on Earth. What happened as a result of the seven-hour war with the Combines? We will fall in love, 100 times, with Eli's gorgeous daughter, Alex Vance, and we will learn many more interesting details. For now, Mr. Freeman, our time has come to an end. While we are preparing the continuation, you can watch other videos on our channel. For example, you can watch the video that you see on your screen right now. Well, we will be back soon with a new video on the Half-Life series. You've watched Press X. See you soon.